Moving is hard, okay. uh, but I should be. You can start now. Okay. Uh, is there any way you could give me the full screen here? Oh, no. No? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll manage. Oh, this is okay. Um, so, good morning, gentle people. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, very excited. First time I'm traveling in three years. Yay. The pandemic is not over, unfortunately, but uh, I guess we'll make do. Um, so I'm going to talk about some hardening features that uh, I had the pleasure to uh, implement. Uh, to, not, not all of them, but uh, anyway. Uh, oh, I'm Alex, uh, and this work was done for AdaCore. Um, so I'll first give a little bit of context of, on, on several of what, I mean, on why th these very different features are all uh, merged into a single speech, uh, like register scrubbing, stack scrubbing, uh, hardened conditionals, hardened booleans, uh, control flow redundancy, and, and some of the testing challenges that I faced. I mean, the, the, these are not directly related, but uh, I'll get to that. So uh, we had uh, an Adacore. We had a partner. We started a partnership with one of our big customers, to to the, and we care about. Uh, hardening features, and they cared about hardening features, and we we got to a collection, a set of features that we wanted to implement. So we did. Uh, the idea was to catch some software uh, glitches and hardware glitches too. Uh, we had a focus on, on Ada and C primarily, uh, and and a few specific uh, targets, uh, architect machine architectures, but. Uh, we had a strong uh, desire to make them work on all languages supported by GCC and all targets supported by GCC. So this was uh, an important driving uh, concern for us. Um, so register scrubbing first. Um, the plan was to implement that, and fortunately we were bidden to, to it. We didn't have to implement it. But we contributed to the implementation in a way. Uh, uh, Oracle uh, uh, had at first an implementation that was very specific to one architecture. And we suggested, well, maybe if you do it this way, then it will work for all architectures. And turns out they liked it, and, and, and it did work for other architectures. So uh, we have machine-independent register scrubbing now. Uh, there's this command line flag that was added in GCC 11. Uh, it's also available as a function attribute uh, if you want to scrub registers only on specific uh, functions. And the way it works is to introduce uh, code uh, late in, the R in, in RTL to zero uh, the registers that you want zeroed. Um, there is a target hook to, to, to handle registers that uh, cannot be set directly from an immediate constant. Uh, and it, there, the, the, it's, the default implementation is smart enough that it seems to be able to catch most cases these days. But if, if there is this very weird architecture that for which it doesn't work, then it can be fixed. Ideally, in generic code, if, 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 if that's possible. But if not, uh, machine-specific extension will do. So you, it's flexible enough that you can uh, zero all the registers or only uh, the registers that are used in the function, uh, or even only the general purpose registers or argument passing registers. They're, they're, it's, 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 yeah? Uh, microphone. Uh, okay. Um, do you have an idea of how much of an impact on performance this makes? I'm guessing not a not lot. Not a clue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, I really don't. Uh, I mean, I took the implementation that was there, right? Uh, I, I didn't actually validate it in any way other than looking that he did what we wanted, and cool. 
So stack scrubbing. This had also an existing implementation uh, that was talked about in a, in a previous cauldron. I think it was in Manchester. Yeah. Um, so, but it hadn't been contributed yet. Uh, and, well, thanks for, 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 for that, Jeremy. Um, turns out that it was machine specific. Uh, it, 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 it required machine-specific code. It worked on x86, it worked on RISC-5. Uh, but I figured, hey, you know what? I, I, I think I can see a way to make that work on all architectures without machine-specific code, without any machine-specific code. So I set out to, to prove myself right or wrong, and, and I did that. But we drew a lot of inspiration from that implementation. Uh, we, the, the, the notion, for instance, that uh, functions that have reg, uh, stack scrubbing enabled can only call other functions that will also scrub the stack so as to avoid leaking information. In the end, we found that a little too restrictive, at least for testing. And then we introduced a relaxed mode uh, that, that doesn't impose this, this, this restraint. Uh, but the, the strict mode is also available, so you can, you can choose. Default is, is relaxed. Uh, I'll get into details soon. Uh, we have proposed this for GCC 12. It didn't make it. It was a little too late, I think. Uh, maybe, well, hopefully GCC 13 will get it. We introduced an attribute that you can use to mark types of functions or, or uh, variables. Um, and, and the way it works is that uh, when you call a function that, is, uh, that has uh, stack scrubbing enabled, then the caller will scrub the stack, will zero the, the, the stack. The caller is modified uh, and, and this makes things a lot easier. You don't have to, 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 to get the function to scrub its own stack while the function is running before returning. You can do that in a context that is a lot more flexible. So that was the insight that I, that I implemented, that I, that I thought of and, and implemented. So in, we, we actually changed this. Yes, Jeremy, microphone please. So I'm glad someone's finished this off and done it properly. That's great. Um, how do you deal with long jump? Because that was something that was a real headache for us. Um, I think we don't. I, as in, we, we, we detect that and say this function cannot be scrubbed because it's, 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 it doesn't work. I mean, the, 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 we, we report a problem there. Um, I hope that's fair enough. <laughs> oh, okay. Have you looked at any of the techniques to minimize uh, cache impacts of doing this? Because, like, you can, you know, in certain cases, you can go ahead and and uh, either uh, try to get it onto one cache page out of a set or stuff like that. And there's lots of tricks to do that. Or did you just go do it and not worry about those kind of things? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I'll show some code examples that will make it clear what, what is actually going on. Uh, I wanted to give a rough idea of, of uh, how, uh, what the approach was before getting to that. But it's on the next slide. So basically, we, we actually changed the signature of functions that, are, that, that have stack scrubbing enabled. Uh, well, some of them and then uh, introduce the, ch the code changes to reflect that in a late eight, uh, IPA pass. And the kind of transformation we do is like this. So we have here a function marked as uh, strubbed, that's short for stack scrub. Uh, um, and so the function is modified in that it gets an extra parameter <clears throat> that is a watermark pointer. Uh, it's going to tell the caller how far its stack uh, use went. Uh, 
And, and, and this makes the interface of the function stack, uh, stack, a scrub-enabled scrub interface, um, which, which means that other uh, functions that have scrubbing enabled can call it uh, without leaking information. Um, and the first thing uh, 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 function that is scrubbed at calls does is to update the watermark saying, oh, I allocated, allocated this much stack space, so uh, make sure you, you clean this up after me. Uh, the caller, so is modified in that it, it, it allocates a watermark variable and initializes it calling uh, strub enter, and then it calls the function with the extra argument, and then when the function returns or escapes with an exception, uh, you call, there's a call for strub leave that will, uh, this is will act, what will actually uh, clear the stack. Now, you may remember I mentioned that data types could also be marked for strubbing. Yes? So I would imagine that in most cases we can statically determine the the amount of stack that's being used. But of course, only very late in the compilation. Um, you probably didn't think of how to leverage this information to avoid this extra parameter? Uh, no, I didn't. I, 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 I actually, uh, well, by the time that I started thinking about optimizations, I, I, I had settled on, on this approach that okay. is compatible with well, it is machine independent, which was very important. Uh, it is able to handle variable stack sizes. And, and, and I figured it was not, uh, it didn't seem important enough to leverage the, the fixed size uh, interfaces at that point. If you inline, then you might get some benefit. But you, you, then you pretty much optimize, I, I won't be able to get into that without more context that I'm yet to present. So okay. uh, hold that idea, uh, uh, I'll try to sneak it in. Now, here I'm marking a variable with uh, uh, for strubbing. Uh, I'll, is that a question? Oh, okay. I wanted to ask, uh, since you said that the, the caller is scrubbing the stack, uh, is this compatible with library functions like yes. in a dynamic library? The, uh, that's, this is exactly what I'm going to talk about now. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you can have a library interface that is in which certain functions are marked uh, as, as uh, having scrubbing enabled in the interface level. Then the, the library both sides, the caller and the callee, have to have that information. And, and, and I mean, the interface is modified. Now, there are cases in which you don't want to modify the interfaces. And, and, and this is where internal uh, strub comes in. So um, the idea is that for these functions, you do not modify the interface. Uh, this is useful. In, in, in the case of libraries, it's also useful in the case of, li of variables that, that are marked for strumming, meaning that you want functions that use this, that read from these variables to be automatically, uh, to, to have strumming enabled automatically for them. So if it's a local variable, then it's just being there is enough. If it's uh, statically allocated, then Reading from it is what triggers the machinery. So you're getting information, and the meaning of the attribute is, if, if you are exposed to that information, I want you to clean up the stack afterwards. So uh, the way it's implemented is that the function is cloned. Its body becomes uh, the wrapped body uh, in, the, in the lower part of the slide. And the original function is replaced with a wrapper that maintains the same interface. And 
and then it does the, the dance of initializing the watermark, calling the function, the, the, the wrapped function, and then cleaning up the stack. So we retain the interface, but we get the, scrub, the, the stack scrubbing uh, of the wrapped function. Now, you may notice that besides the extra watermark parameter, there are other changes that we uh, make uh, for, for the sake of optimization. Big parameters are not copied again. The, in, the wrapper takes them by reference. Um, we handle uh, variable argument lists. We, we couldn't possibly copy all the arguments because you don't know anything about them. But we take the list and pass the list to the wrapped version, and then the wrapped version, wherever it would initialize the, the, the variable argument list, it copies from this hidden argument. It works. Uh, not beautiful, but seems to be working. So um, the built-ins that we use for entering uh, scrub contexts and updating the watermark and, and doing the actual scrubbing are inlineable. Uh, and depending on the optimization level, uh, what we do is initialize the watermark uh, for, for enter. We initialize the watermark with the stack pointer. Uh, this is the initial level of the watermark. Unless you're in a function that was called by, uh, that, that, that already has uh, scrubbing enabled, then we take its watermark instead. Uh, this is useful. Well, I'm not actually sure that this is useful. In the end, it doesn't make a lot of difference because it's going to be overwrit overwritten afterwards. But uh, when you update, now in the context of the call E, the, the, the function that it has scrubbing enabled, uh, we, you comp we compare the current watermark value with the stack pointer plus or less red zone, depending on whether stack grows upward or downward. Uh, I have only tested one of these. <laughs> if you're familiar with any machine in which the, stacks, the stack grows the wrong way, <laughs> I'd love to try that. But I have only tested the usual one. Uh, so uh, basically, we would say uh, if, 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 uh, if you're using more stack than the watermark had, then well, update the watermark. Oh, and if you're inside, a uh, if you're inlined into a function that has its own watermark, then update that too, because otherwise things might go wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's not worth going to the details of how it might go wrong. The, there, there are paragraphs in, in the implementation uh, explaining what, what might go wrong. Uh, and then shrub leave is, is uh, turning to a conditional call if we are uh, at O2 or higher. Uh, so we can bypass the strubbing if we were not going to clean anything anyway, which happens often after inlining, uh, nested inlining and stuff like that. Uh, at O3, we actually generate the loop. Uh, and and I, I might have written a mem set here, but the mem set turned out to be uh, harder to parse than the, the explicit loop because of support for uh, stack growing upwards or downwards. So that's what the E and P uh, may be reversed depending on the uh, direction of the stack. But the idea is that we loop over uh, the, the interval between current stack pointer and uh, watermark and, and clean, up, clean that up at O3 or higher. Also, uh, when, when we have nested inlining or tail calling, uh, we pass on the watermark pointer from the, the caller to the callee so as to uh, defer 
the, the, the cleaning up and, and enable the tail calling. Now, um, besides the, the pass that actually makes this code changes, uh, there is an earlier pass that assigns modes to the functions. It looks at the code, looks at the variables, looks at what gets called from where, and, and, and assigns uh, a suitable strub mode to each function. Specifically, if, if you request uh, strubbing at calls, it will honor that or report an error. If you request internal uh, strubbing, it will honor that or report an error. If you request through a command line flag that it, it, it be enabled, then it will try one of these modes. Uh, if, if you mark a function to be callable from strub context, then it will check. Uh, it will honor that. If you're in strict mode, then it, it will check that only functions that are callable uh, from uh, strub context are being called. Uh, if, if a function has uh, strub disabled and you call it from a strub context, then it will report a problem. So this, this, you asked me not to allow you to do that. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> so, uh, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's what was wanted. Uh, I, I'm not sure I mentioned that. I think I didn't mention that before, but uh, when you call, you know, like, oh, there's a question. Two questions? OK. So my question would be, you always talk about inlining. So I assume the inlining sees the drop enter and leave inlined into an other function at the gimbal level, and you're not talking about nested up about the call chain. So if, if you actually see that, then and, and this, this watermark pointer is a pointer to basically the stack, right? So and, and at strap leave, that's where the clearing is supposed to happen, uh -huh. correct? Yeah. So, so how do you deal with Gimple, when you have a, a stack variable that doesn't have its address taken, um, that it will think it, it won't alias anything at all, even if you have the most conservative points to information for the watermark pointer, the, 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 this call will not alias stores to not address taken stack variables. So they can be, in theory, freely moved around the strap leaf call. Of course, maybe nothing, there's no incentive to do that, but in theory, nothing prevents that. And I don't see how you fix that. So, so I wonder why do you do the instrumentation before inlining and not after inlining? Um, we do inlining before introducing these calls, uh, except for. Um, well, there's IPA inlining, and then there is uh, tray inlining afterwards, if I remember correctly. Late inlining. Uh, oh, OK. So uh, yes. So there are two different inlines, and we do it between those two. So uh, it may happen. Um, and. I'm not sure, but it may be the reason why we, we turned the inline strub leave into um, uh, a conditional. And, and the, the adjustments to defer inlining to the caller of the uh, inline combination is to address this sort of problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, not sure, uh, I'm not sure this is the only reason for that. But it's certainly one of the reasons for, for, for that transformation. So I, I honestly don't remember that this was the only reason. But, but it, 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 that's the way it is addressed. So did you consider moving the instrumentation after the final inlining? Or, or why, why do you even... even, even uh, want to run into the situation that you have to enable this transform of undoing, basically undoing the instrumentation after inlining. That's essentially what the expansion 
uh, ends up doing in a way. So, I didn't, uh, I, at that point, I did not consider changing that because it, 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 it was working. It was, uh, I mean, it, it, it was solid. So, I was happy with that, but presumably it, it would make things different. Have you considered uh, doing the stack scrubbing at, in the function epilog instead of doing it in the color? Because That's... in the function epilog, you, you know the size of the, of the stack you consumed, and perhaps uh, you could do it in steps like uh, at the start of the epilogue, clean most of it, and then, then deal with, uh, with those few bytes from yeah, the, that, that was the, the registers. Yeah, that was the uh, uh, stack erase implementation did. And I, I, I didn't see how to do that in a machine-independent way. Uh, I, I figured that to, to, to modify the epilogue uh, in, in, in several circumstances, we, we we found ourselves needing a special register to hold, uh, to be able to iterate over the range, and 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 having to select a register, uh, and, and particularly in architectures that don't have a lot of registers, which are not so common these days. But uh, I, I didn't feel that this was the way to go. I thought uh, having the allowing the caller to deal with this with entire flexibility. W w would make for a more, far more portable implementation. Uh, so I went for that. That's true, but well, maybe it could be mostly done in generic code and with, with a few, with, with a one that's target exactly, hook. That's or, exactly or, what Stack Race does. Yeah. It, because it, there uh, is very little machine-specific code. It, it has the but advantage that it doesn't change the ABI. We don't change the ABI. We inter if you, if you, if you add the wrappers, yes, then. If you add the wrappers, then the ABI is preserved. If you uh, mark the function as having a special property, then it does. So the, there's no uh, behind-the-scenes change going on. It's 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 all uh, visible and a, as the user requests. So I I, I think that's fine. Um, so, wrapping up this this uh, uh, this feature. Um, so we don't split functions that have uh, shrubbing enabled. We could, but that that was not implemented. We have to enable shrubbing both. Um, we are careful about not inlining functions that require stack scrubbing into functions that don't have stack scrubbing enabled. And there is a potential improvement to be made uh, when we decide that we're, we're not inlining a function into another function because of this. And then we inline this function into another that has scrubbing enabled. Then we could go back and revisit the, 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 more, the innermost function and, and try to inline that. There is no logic to do that right now. Um, there is an optimization in GCC that removes a stack adjustment after a call if we are just about to return. Uh, we have to disable that when, when strumming is enabled for a function. Otherwise, we, we won't clean up the entire uh, stack uh, for the callee. Um, there, because in some cases we call a function to, to uh, scrub the stack uh, instead of expanding it inline, uh, there is a small uh, stack range that may not be scrubbed that the stack scrubbing function uses. Um, I've pondered uh, introducing a, a small loop after the call to clean up that stack range too. But I haven't done that. Uh, it didn't seem uh, important enough. Uh, yeah?
do you think that uh, this implementation would be extensible enough that if an architecture um, supported either like a, some kind of mode where it was doing this or new instructions, that it would be easy to add that kind of support in instead of doing uh, routines or inlines? So an intrinsic of some sort? Uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about performance, right? And uh, if you tell the architecture this is what you want to do, it can optimize things in order to you know, minimize cache impacts and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it, it would not be uh, explicit code that did this. It would be either a mode or, or a set of instructions. So remember when I mentioned that I wrote the, the, the inline loop as a loop because the memset call was harder to parse? That was only for the slide. The, the, the actual generated code is a memset, which is to see, uh, uses an optimized sequence to, to, to expand. So, so doing that would be easy for... It's, it's already done, it's already is what done. I'm saying. Okay. Thanks. I mean, it was already done before, I just used the existing feature. So uh, for testing purposes, you can enable uh, strubbing for all functions or even select which mode you, you, you want to prefer. Uh, I've used this for, to bootstrap GCC, and it's pretty cool. It it's, cleans up everything after itself, and, and, and it's beautiful. <laughs> So hardened conditionals, this is in GCC 12 already. We have two new flags, one to harden uh, conditional branches and the other to harden compares, which uh, compute a Boolean and store it in, in, in a variable typically. Uh, and the idea here is to catch uh, hardware glitches like a power deprived processor that, that yields a result that if you do the same operation in a slightly different way, it will yield a different, an incompatible result, and, and then you catch the condition that oh, something's wrong, I better stop running because otherwise I might leak a, a private key or something. Um, so the, what we do is to reverse the compare. The, there is a, there is a compare, be it for a branch, be it to store the result. We reverse that. I think the next slide will show in better detail. So we have a compare, uh, and if, if the result is true, then we perform the same, uh, the reversed operation and check that the result is also the reverse. Uh, if, if we got true and the the reverse test also gets true. Oops, something is wrong. Stop running. Uh, if we got false, and then the reverse operation uh, also gets false, then oops, something is wrong. Better stop running. Uh, you know that, that uh, there is a prime uh, marker on each of the uh, comparisons that use Apparently, the same variables. This is, uh, to, to, this is supposed to mean uh, that we took a copy of the variable, uh, or not necessarily a copy, but we, we made GCC forget that it had already tested that, that compare to avoid it being just optimized away. Uh, when we compare uh, and store in a variable, we basically do the same thing, but without branches too. Uh, in one case or the other, we follow the pattern of the original code. We reverse the operation, and if we get the same result for the original compare and the reverse compare, then something's wrong, stop running. Uh, and in the, the second case, uh, we may find uh, vector uh, compares, and uh, I didn't deal with that. We could deal with that, uh, but the trick, the, the tricky, slightly tricky part is that we don't want to, to just test that the results are the same. We want to test if any of the compares in the vector uh, yielded true uh, or yielded the same result, and if so, we want to abort. So there's no, there, there is not exactly an uh, animated way to do that. 
uh, but it's in, in sort of the roadmap, I suppose. Hardened booleans. Uh, the idea here is to increase the Hamming distance between true and false so that a single bit flip will, will, will not go undetected. Um, this catches uh, RAM problems or sometimes even CPU problems. Um, and we, we, we have this feature is pretty much built into ADA. Um, so the, the f first four lines in the code block here uh, are standard ADA, and they define a, 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 boolean, a, a boolean type that in ADA is an enumeration uh, that has constants false and true associated with specific X uh, values 5A and A5 in this case, which are uh, with eight bits are a maximal Hamming distance. Every bit has to be flipped. Yeah? Microphone? Wouldn't it make a bit more sense to use values that actually slightly overlap so that you could actually check for the, um, the case when the, they were flipped by some other code? Uh, yeah, I guess. You, 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 you can define the values. The, the, the point is you can use whatever values you like. Okay, so right. the, yeah. this is, this is, it's this flexible. You, but you right. can choose yeah. the constants. Something like five you, five and five eight. You can use the, the yeah. you can choose the, the, the width of the, the booleans. You can choose the represented uh, the presented uh, uh, values that are going to be stored. And the, 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 the catch here is that if if any value any different value is stored, then ADA validity checking will will detect that and, and raise an exception. What we, we added here is a, uh, an attribute to mark uh, this kind of Boolean to make sure that validity checking is done at every uh, point of use, because ADA is flexible in the sense that you could check at the point of store, and then you wouldn't detect the, the situation that we wanted to detect, which is what you stored in memory is not what you got back. Now, we proposed it for C as well as an extension. Uh, the, this, this attribute was proposed for GCC 13, uh, in which you, we add the hard bool attribute that takes two, oper two optional operands. Uh, first one is the value for false, and the second is the value for true. If you don't provide it, then it will use the bit flipped pattern of false. And if you don't provide false, it will use zero. Um, it's a modifier for integral types. So you can choose the width that way. Um, and it's a very simple language extension in that every, any uh, R value you use decays to bool. So it's checked at that point. And when you, when, when you compare two other types, whether from or to uh, hardened booleans, uh, you, you, you always go through bool first, and then, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very simple model, ma mental model. Uh, here's some code samples. Uh, zero initialization, uh, thanks Richard, uh, uh, it was worth mentioning in the docs. Um, we, well, it, it's not uh, written as zero unless you, you request zero as a false pattern, but it, it gets initialized to false. Uh, and auto initialization doesn't happen. So if you, you get garbage, you will, using that variable will, will trap. Yeah? Oh, and in C, it's a trap. It doesn't raise an exception like Ada. Um, what happens if you compare a hardened bool with an integer or a car? Is that a trap it, as well? It, every R value gets converted to bool. So the, the, okay. the, it, it checks for the pattern at that point and then decides is it false or true. And, and, and from that point on, it's a standard bool that, that gets compared. So 
very simple mental model, very small language extension. Uh, for the static or uh, file scope variables, you so so you don't zero but store the f five uh, a. Uh, what do you do about unions in those variables? If if you have uh, a union of hard bool and you get you pretty much get what you ask for. If you uh, initialize it as a, a hardened boolean, then you, you will get the conversion. If you initialize it as something else and access it as, as a hardened boolean, then that's undefined behavior. You, you get what you ask for. So what is first in the union uh, gets initialized by default? Uh, yeah, if, if you don't talking, have an Since initializer. we're talking about C, yeah. C++, th this does not work in C++, if you want something like that, like this, it's make, it makes more sense to, to write a class. So uh, this is C only. Control flow redundancy, uh, that's proposed for GCC 13, and it's, it's intended to catch uh, unexpected, as in not compatible with the control flow graph execution paths. Uh, we instrument the function so that every basic block will set a bit in a bitmap, like this. So in every, the, the, there is this uh, bitmap initialized to zero in, in the beginning of the function, and then every block sets its, its corresponding bit in the bitmap, and at the end, at, at, at every return path, we call a built-in function to verify that the control flow graph is compatible with that bit pattern. Um, in this case, we have three blocks. In theory, it could be as many as, uh, well, as many as the function has. Um, at every edge to the return block, what we check currently is that for every uh, block that was visited, that is for every block that has its bit set, we have at least one of its predecessors set and at least one of its successors set. Uh, we have thought about handling loops and stuff like that, but the overhead was so significant here that I thought that, that uh, adding per iteration tests was not going to go well. So I haven't gone down that path. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard to introduce, but it's not done. Um, very recently, after the last code submission, I introduced other flags to, to handle, uh, to introduce checking also at exception escape points. Um, that's enabled by default. We introduce a cleanup around the, the entire function um, with exceptions, so to speak, uh, as in uh, a function that would return directly. And it, uh, we, we, if you can insert the check before that function, that's another option there, uh, then we skip the, the cleanup if it raises an exception. This is a small optimization. Um, in order to uh, enable sib calls uh, or tail calls, we uh, detect, but it's too early at the point we do this to actually tell what is going to be a tail call and what isn't. So I named these returning calls. There's functions that are called and whose return value is returned to the caller without any intervening uh, uh, operation. Um, we can, we, we can move the check before these, and then uh, uh, that's optional. Uh, we can also uh, introduce checking before no return calls, which may be useful. Um, if, if the no return call uh, actually doesn't ever, uh, uh, if, if it doesn't immediately terminate the program, if it loops forever, it might make sense for you. You may want to check before calling it instead of waiting for it to return, which will never happen, to then check that the control flow graph was, was uh, respected. Now, uh, 
If you introduce checks for every no return call, then there are some no return calls that actually return uh, uh, control through exceptions. And then if you have a local handler, uh, it will modify the visited uh, bitmap, and then it may call another no return function, and so on and so forth, and then you get multiple checks. And that's, uh, that, that's more overhead than we would probably like. So uh, I thought, well, maybe we don't want to check before no returns. Yeah? Sorry if this is a, you already covered this. What is the attack that this is protecting against? Or what is the problem um, that this is solving? Basically, if I understand correctly, uh, it's supposed to catch uh, return to the middle of functions, uh, or jumps to the middle of functions, or... Um, so or it's is it basically stopping, is it ROP gadgets? Yeah, but, th but that's one of the cases. There's also CPU malfunctioning that, that, that like memory bit flips that they change code pointers and you end up at some unexpected place and it it doesn't crash before you, you reach the end of the function, then this will see that something odd happened and, and stop uh, damaging some, I mean, trying to stop execution before it breaks yeah, and, something. And stop closer to the source of the problem rather than at some undefined point later. Can't count on that really. But yeah, the, the, it's stop as soon as possible, or as soon as reasonable. Um, so back to no throw, um, uh, uh, no return. So I figured, well, maybe we want to check just before calling no throw functions, or not instrument before, uh, uh, before a no throw call because of the, the issue of checking again and again and again. Um, so I, I, I realized that a common situation that got me into undesirable early checking was uh, just before calling uh, one of the functions used in the internal implementation of exception raising. You're calling a function that you know that's going to raise an exception, but it's no return. So I introduced an option to not instrument those, but instrument all the other no return functions. And then we mark internally the functions used in the exception handling implementation, that these are expected to throw functions. Uh, it's kind of an internal attribute. I'm not sure about exposing that. It might be useful to expose it. I, I, I was looking for other uh, potential uses for this, and the only one that came to mind was marking the exception, uh, block, the exception handling block that takes care of the exception raised by that function as hot as opposed to cold. And that's not really worth it. So uh, if anyone can think of, an, of, of another use for this attribute, uh, uh, please let me know, and then maybe we expose it to, to, to users. But uh, I'm not sure about doing that. I, I, I don't see that as really useful, except for this very specific uh, circumstance. Um, so uh, we, we inline the testing, the, the, the verification at the end of the function. Uh, if there is a single exit path in the function, and if there are uh, no more than 16 blocks in the function, otherwise we, we issue an out of line call. Uh, there are parameters to control this. Um, and basically what the, 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 the way we represent the runtime control flow graph for verification is a reasonably compact but very inefficient uh, uh, in terms of performance uh, for uh, verification. I'm not uh, entirely happy with this, but it's what we got so far. Uh, basically, for every block, there are two lists of, of uh, tuples. Uh, first one for the predecessors. Is that the right way to say it in English? Thank you. Um, and, and, and so a pairs of bit mask 
to look, uh, a bit pattern to look for at least one bit set in the visited bitmap and the index into the visited bitmap. So look at this word. If you see one of these bits, then OK, you're, you're, you're fine. You found that at least one of the predecessors were, was visited. We're good. Then another list, uh, it's, it's zero terminated. Uh, not a pair of zeros, just a single zero, because it was more compact uh, and less efficient, I suppose. I didn't measure this significantly, by the way. Um, and then the same thing for the successors. Uh, so you can, again, you go through each of them and see, is any of these bits set? If so, we're good. Uh, otherwise, trap. Um, and the way to represent uh, the, the address from the entry block or to the exit block is by using uh, the own block bit, which enables us to avoid representing the entry and the exit blocks in this representation. So one of the issues that I faced while testing these, some of these features was that it's a little hard to, to, to simulate a memory error or a random CPU uh, error. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, could it, huh? Yeah. There's KMU, there's, uh, we could use GDB and, and, and attach to a specific point and, and, and flip a bit and stuff like that. But I mean, it, 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 is, it, is, it is limited, very limited. It's limiting in that you pretty much have to introduce the, 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 the test uh, right there, at least the GDB uh, idea that I entertained for some time. Uh, I can't like take the whole compiler and enable the, this flag and, and throw it a, 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 a bootstrap pass and, 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 and catch situations that I didn't think of before. I have to like engineer the, the tests to catch uh, the problems that I was able to think of. So it, it's more limiting in, in a way. I, I, I like uh, to be able to, well, in, 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 in previous projects, I often uh, had the advantage of uh, running Bootstrap and, and enable debug information or disable debug information and, and, and check that the generated code was the same. This was a, a very good way to catch problems. I, I, I wasn't that lucky in this project. Alexandra, so, I think I'll, I'll dig it out for you. There was a PhD, and I can't for the life of me, I, I reviewed it and I, about three or four years ago at TUM on exactly how to set up hardware to give you the, to test this stuff. Awesome. Uh, I, I can remember the, first guy, the guy's first name. He's one of your compatriots, Raoul, but I, I can't for the life of me remember his second name. I'll dig it out and send it Please to Please send me an email. Yeah. This, is, this is a real hard problem for this. How do you prove it works on hardware just, rather than just in simulation? Awesome. Uh, I, I would love to, to, to get more testing coverage for, for the error paths uh, that, that haven't got a lot of coverage so far. Um, I mentioned using Bootstrap for testing. Uh, yeah? May I, on the subject of testing, and maybe a, a higher level question about testing of hardening features, uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, have you kind of engaged with any, I guess, penetration testers to sort of attack? Sorry? I... Uh, do you know penetration testing? Yeah. Where, you know, we, we, we're here with our sort of defense hats on mm -hmm. in terms of how do we protect against attacks, but you know, specialists who are like kind of the bad, you know, friendly bad guys to like how well does this mitigate and like, oh, is there like a, they can just step around it, there's some weakness. Uh, I wondered if you, for, for various different hardening approaches you've tried, um, if you've kind of had a friendly, uh, um, would it be black hat or whatever, gray hat or something, um, attack them. So uh, I mentioned early in the speech that this was a kind of a partnership. Uh, so we, we, we have supplied the implementations to, well, the early implementations to the, the, the partner. And I at least had an expectation that they were going to like throw rocks at it and, and see whether it served well the, 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 the purpose. 
Uh, I, I, I haven't heard a lot back. So I, I'm not sure that means that it actually worked. Uh, I, 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 have to, I have to verify that assumption, but uh, I, I really don't know so far. Um, so wrapping up, um, one, one trick that, that I often resorted to was to enable, uh, or to introduce an option to enable it for, for everything and, and, and run a bootstrap, run the test suite, and, and there are lots of errors in general when you change the code patterns. There are lots of tests that expect specific code patterns, and then we have to check that those well, okay, it, it, it changed the code, but it, it, it broke the expectations of the test, but it didn't, it doesn't mean that we have a problem here. So it's not extremely convenient, but it helps uh, grow the, 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 the test coverage. <clears throat> uh, one particularly uh, interesting case here is that uh, testing scrubbing, testing stack scrubbing after you release a portion of the stack, uh, you, you may take a timer signal and that may write stuff into that part of the stack. And this actually happens in, in testing pretty frequently using QEMU. I don't know exactly why, but then the expected zeros weren't there. And then, oh, there's something wrong with, with the stack, stack clearing? No. It's, it's fine, it's just that uh, the, this unexpect, the unexpected uh, stack change took place and, and it seemed like something went wrong. But uh, accessing stack space that has been released or any memory space that has already been released is always risky in this regard. Um, in the end, we have Lots of tests, handwritten, and, and, and verifying that the, the code is doing what we expect. And, and that's uh, s somehow unsatisfying to me. I would like to get a lot more coverage than that. And, and, and um, I look forward to Jeremy's email. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much for bearing with me. There was a lot of material to cover. Uh, I hope it wasn't uh, too uh, uh, too much information, too much time. I don't. I didn't take note when we started. Do we have still time for questions? Uh, yeah, I think we. Uh, yes, I think we have uh, time. Uh, are there any questions? I see. So, uh, as I was saying, any questions? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, is there a question? No, thank you very much.
Test one two. Test one two. Test, test one two, test one two, one two three four, one, one two three four five. Test, test one two, one two three. Test one two, test one two. and all targets supported by GCC. So this was uh, an important driving uh, concern basis. And, and, and this is where internal uh, strub comes in. Uh, uh, not a pair of zeros.
everything is set up now. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I hope. Uh, Before we start, uh, there is uh, one camera, and it's uh, it's zoomed to this this location. Ah, okay. So if you if you if, if you it, stay here, uh, the people on online can see you, but I can zoom out the camera. But you yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. It's up to you. <coughs> Yeah. So uh, good evening. Uh, so I will present today what would he do for if conversion for a partially predicated VLIW architecture using the GCC framework of if conversion. <coughs> so uh, this work is done at Carray. Carray is a company manufacturing uh, data processing uh, unit which are uh, a uh, processor used in IO acceleration, edge computing, and uh, autonomous uh, vehicle uh, driving. So it's a company founded in uh, 2008, and we, we have 200 people today. So I will present uh, what we have in the processor, and more importantly, the core, which is a, a modern VLIW architecture. Then uh, I will uh, go quickly over what we did to have a GCC deliver excellent results on that uh, instruction set architecture. Then I will uh, explain more, summarize what is the existing uh, if conversion framework of GCC, then the uh, extension we did for our architecture, and, and then uh, first results and uh, what we will do next. So the processor we manufacture, uh, you can see on, on those ones, this, this is a, a, a board that goes into a, a server for IO acceleration, especially so, solid stage uh, storage management. <coughs> this processor, in fact, is a complex uh, system on chip. It contains uh, 80 application cores. Each application core has, has a deep learning coprocessor tightly coupled to it. I will not discuss the tightly coupled coprocessor, but GCC is also excellent to uh, manage the resources of this uh, deep learning coprocessor. <coughs> the, the five, uh, uh, the, the 80 cores are dispatched into uh, five uh, compute units that we call clusters, 
So each compute unit has uh, 16 application core and 16 uh, core processor. And so I will uh, discuss uh, what we do for the core itself. Uh, the, the system is running uh, between 600 and 1.2 gigahertz, and this is our third generation, generation C of MPPA, the line of uh, massive par parallel architecture of Calray, and it's MPPA V1 Coolidge. To explain a little bit more, and after we go into the details, we've been manufacturing many core processors for several years. <clears throat> And we are currently in the blue box, so we're using a 16 nanometer node, and uh, we uh, iterate, uh, we, we sell this uh, processor that I will present, and we are currently taping out uh, uh, an iteration of it with a significant improvement in deep learning in particular. So uh, it's uh, all those uh, cores are based on the v, uh, VLIW, very long instruction world architecture, so it's an uh, I think everyone is familiar with uh, what is a VLW. <clears throat> so it's uh, basically compiler-driven uh, extraction and exploitation of instruction-level parallelism. So the compiler will have to find a group of parallel instructions. So it's a good choice for some uh, class of, ac of application, especially uh, acceleration, because it's uh, simple to uh, implement, energy efficient, Time predictable, this matters when you do uh, some kind of automated uh, driving, and, uh, so, and implementation is, uh, is uh, easier. But it's in interesting and important to know that there are two families of VLIW which are not the same, and often they are, they are confused. So there is a classic uh, VLIW architecture by Joss Fisher uh, in 79 uh, and uh, 81. And then later, there is the EPIC VLIW architecture from uh, Bob Rowe team. And uh, the VLIW architecture eventually uh, uh, became the Play Doh architecture and the IS64 architecture. Uh, the VLIW architecture, the classic one, uh, started in uh, Trace uh, machines. Then uh, Josh Fisher went to uh, East Coast uh, HP Labs uh, and he refined the uh, classic VLIW for embedded and media processing. This kind of VLIW was used in particular uh, at ST Microelectronics, and, and, and I work on this architecture and its uh, tools. So when we uh, founded Carre, we found the benefits of a Fisher-style uh, VLIW architecture, but also we saw the shortcomings of the one provided by ST Micro that was the ST200, but known as the LX VLIW architecture. So the key uh, feature is that in the classic VLIW architecture, you only have partial predication, as that will be the topic today. That is, if you want to do a conditional execution of some operation, you can only do that on a select between register values or conditional load, conditional stores, and on the latest trace machine on a conditional floating point operation. On an EPIC machine, uh, all the instruction set is uh, fully predicated, and th this idea has been uh, uh, continued in more modern implementation of uh, EPIC style VLIW, in particular uh, the TIC6 uh, line of DSP, which have the full predication, the rotating register. But our, our talk is more for classic VLIW architecture. Now, of course, we don't do just classic, we try to improve things. So, how can we improve over a classic VLIW architecture? Because we are talking of compiler here, and, and the main objective of, of a Carré architecture design was to have a machine which is very easy to compile. We don't need very exotic comp compiler unlike IS64 machines. So um, uh, one thing would be when you compile for that machine, you don't have to uh, think about uh, building uh, VLIW templates, which is a, a, a quite a messy a part of the compilers. So in this machine, the uh, uh, pipeline execution resources are such that every time the, the scheduler decides you can issue those instructions in parallel, they will encode as is and form a valid bundle. So you just have to put in the assembler a marker saying this is the end of my group of parallel instruction according to the scheduler, and that will make uh, instruction bundle. Another improvement we have, of course, is that we don't have to pad no ops everywhere. This is uh, no longer uh, useful on, on, on modern VLIW. So the comp compilation is quite uh, straightforward, just uh, like for in-order core. 
But then we improve over classic VLIW. We have a vector scalar uh, instruction set architecture, meaning that all uh, Boolean address, integer, CMD vectors, they are held in the same general purpose register file. And when you have a wide operands, you use a pair or quadruple of registers. It turns out that uh, uh, GCC is excellent as a, uh, in allocating for such register files. So we have a between, so it's a basically a 64 bit architecture, but we have a 128 and 256 uh, uh, operands with register pair and quadruples. This machine has to be uh, good in uh, DSP, that is a numerical image uh, signal processing and not counting the deep learning, which is uh, uh, taken care of by, by the coprocessor that we see on uh, this part of, of the picture. Uh, other things that we added uh, for, for compiling for high performance, so we have the hardware loop, but that, that's a classic thing. We have the non-temporal loads. So in fact, it's a non-temporal memory access is that when you instruct the compiler to bypass some level of the memory hierarchy and this prevent cache turbulence. If you want to load with re re reuse or do not have a, a dense uh, access patterns, you don't want the cache to bring a lot of uh, useless data. So you want to uh, do a cache bypass <coughs> load. And also because it's a classic VLIW, we want uh, non-trapping load so we can decide to uh, control speculate load in advance in while loop, for instance, and if, we, if the address goes in the IO space or does meme, I, or the uh, fault, it will just return zero. And uh, it's very capable for CPU capabilities. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we support Linux or the PIC model or the, or the TLS models. And moreover, we are fully uh, recursive uh, uh, virtualization of ISA. So any kind of software can run at any privilege level and you cannot see that in other uh, architecture. So <clears throat> the code generation part, uh, we have a, a tool chain and it's uh, mostly built out of uh, open source and free software uh, components. So the main part are, are the, uh, of course, uh, uh, compiler, linker, uh, binary utilities, libc, and, and debugger, etc. So we have mainly GCC, Linux, and we also have LLVM. So we have LLVM because we have a complete uh, uh, chain of uh, OpenCL where we have the uh, Bogle framework relying on the LLVM and passing the conformance. But we are going to talk about uh, the, the GCC port, even though we have a parallel port with LLVM <coughs> for this VLIW. So w w when we have this uh, architecture to co compile for in GCC, uh, we do the classic uh, stuff for GCC, which is very uh, 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 capable. So we map the hardware loop with uh, dual patterns. This is classic. Uh, we uh, push the last scheduling phase very late in the compilation, in the RTL flow. So it sees the whole expansion, of all the uh, instruction, and creates the schedule, which, which is the, bu the bundle of the instruction. So we don't want to, to mess with instruction just uh, after that. And uh, all the classic optimization uh, of uh, GCT, they work. So here uh, we see an example of a very simple loop where we enable uh, tree vectorization. And in order to make the code uh, easy to read, we uh, do, don't do O3. So it doesn't do a massive unrolling and pipelining of the inner loop. But what you can see in this loop, it's very simple. It's mapping the hardware loop. It's loading the, the two input streams. So it load, it's loading 256 uh, bits, that is eight float values at a time. You see the result go into uh, register quadruples. We also have an addressing mode, which is index of index. So it's not uh, just simple uh, risk-like uh, addressing mode. We have addressing mode, which can be register plus register or register plus register scale by the uh, item size. Then you have a dual issuing of uh, the floating point uh, add word. So we uh, do a quadruple floating point add here. And because uh, we, we operate on the, on, the, on the eight values, the compiler has decomposed the vector instruction into two uh, uh, parallel instructions, which uh, must issue a, dif a different clock cycle. Then we store the results and the increment. Um, the, the, the pointer. So you see it's very simple uh, to compile. Uh, and I should mention the double column is the end of a parallel group as seen by the scheduler, which is the same as the end of instruction bundle. 
so in order to deal with the uh, uh, advanced, uh, with the uh, uh, non-trapping load and the non-temporal load, that is a level one cache bypass load, we, we leverage the uh, GCC support for the name address space. So it was a proposed extension for DSP uh, uh, machines. And it's very useful. It's been used in some target of GCC for uh, different uh, hardware address spaces. Here, it's, uh, we, are, we have a single address space, but we just annotate the pointer we want this to be in cache or to bypass cache or to be non-trapping or to do both, which we call them uh, streaming loads. It's non-trapping and bypass level one uh, cache. It's very useful for, for deep vector loops. And you see all the difference. So here we have an addressing mode where we scale this uh, index by the item size. And then um, we, uh, we have, uh, that's the only modifier. We bypass level one, it means uncache. Here we, uh, we, uh, we bypass the cache and we are in a silent or non-trapping mode and here we are in non-trapping mode. So all that done by uh, name address space, but because we don't have them in C++, uh, we had to introduce uh, uh, built-ins uh, in case you have to use C++, which is an inconvenience. On LLVM, we can have this working in C++. Now, uh, a key part is a vector scale architecture. So first, uh, we rely on, on all the uh, GCC machinery. Uh, then, because we have the vector scalar, the vector are maintained into a tuple of register. We must pass them around, and we have a slight uh, things to, to do at the ABI level, because at the ABI level, we pass in 12 register, can be misaligned with regard to the register pair or quadruple. So we just have to adjust for that. And then uh, this code illustrate, you do a simple add of eight floats, and you see that it with a scalar, and the scalar will be first converted into uh, one word, which is, uh, then co contains the duplicate the FP32, and then this word is become a, a vector, and the vector is operated just like in the previous loop. Another trick we have, which we found very helpful with this architecture, we implemented the bit matrix multiply operation that was uh, introduced in the uh, Cray YMPs, and then uh, at uh, Princeton University 10 years ago, uh, Ribilly and Hillewitz demonstrated all the wide use of that kind of arithmetic, and uh, it's very useful. In particular, we use it for all the shuffling, splatting, and inserting, and merging of vectors. And, and then uh, we found also something that with a vector scalar, if you let uh, the vector operation decompose into elementary 64-bit uh, operation, then uh, uh, pre-pass scheduling will move things around, and register allocation will have a big mess to register allocate. And we found experimentally that it's much better to tell the compiler uh, you just have big operands until after register allocation. And after register allocation, we, we may split or we, we don't split them. If we don't split them, we still have a partial instruction bundles in the output template, but given the scheduling feature of that machine, we did not lose any kind of performance. And, and to conclude <coughs> on the generic approach, uh, we have to uh, compile for a lot of code coming from other sources, from ARM, from uh, x86. And so uh, we complement a compiler with two things. One is a, is a SLIF uh, library which implements vectorized variant of, uh, of all the LIBEM. And then the SCMD project, which is very useful because it translates between uh, major ISA built-ins uh, type and function uh, to plain C, or you can optimize your translation. So here we see an optimized translation uh, back to the uh, uh, built-ins of our architecture. So this is a conditional uh, selection. And uh, uh, so either we fall back and SMD vectorize, in fact, expand to uh, OpenMP SIMD uh, directive, so it says to vectorize the loop. Otherwise, you can call when you tune the translation. So, uh, so, so in that case, you can have a, a machine that compile a lot of code and give a quite decent uh, performance results. Now I will go into uh, just a refresher of the control flow template, and I illustrate them on the KVX uh, port. So uh, it's not very complex, but uh, it's uh, mostly the same for all uh, similar architecture. I mean, architectures that do not have condition codes, but can uh, uh, compare and test general purpose register, which is our case because we are vector scalar architecture. 
So the first uh, template, so this is uh, the output of a MD dump. So MD dump, so you, you uh, undo all the factoring you have in the MD file, so it's quite uh, easier to understand. So the first one explains what you do to uh, create a, a Boolean value, a, a store flag value out of a, a, a comparison. And it's, uh, it's um, a set of, uh, you compare operator and, and you send to destination. Then you have the main way to represent a conditional jump in GCC. You have a if then else uh, expression that uh, rely on the output of a compare operator, and we select between the PC, which will be the next one, or give give a label. So you see a set of if then else of PC. So these are the two ways you can control any kind of branching, and this is the way it works for most machines. Now, if you want to do conditional moves, conditional moves are quite uh, useful. You, uh, the first one who, who used them a lot was the uh, DEC Alpha machine, and the first compiler to use them uh, extensively was the GEM compiler in the 90s. So a conditional move is interesting because it can be represented in two different ways in a GCC infrastructure. One way is, uh, again, if then else, just like the branch, but you, you uh, assign to, uh, to something and, uh, and not to the PC. And another thing to, uh, to, to see is that you can compare any type with any uh, kind of construct or restriction to select another kind of uh, data. So this is a here standard integer, and I, uh, here I uh, conditional move uh, double precision floating point. But this is uh, the basic conditional move uh, when not doing uh, advanced if conversion. When you run the if conversion framework in GCC, it goes into another construct, which is called condexec. So condexec also works to uh, describe uh, anything of a conditional, or I should say predicated execution. But when you apply it to conditional move, or when you have to do conditional move later in the compiler, which is in, uh, in our case, it's a different construct. Condexec says, I, I, I see the output of a test expression, just like this one, but now what I will conduct is a complete pattern of an instruction. So here is just a pattern of moving data. And so if you apply that to move, you have the two forms of conditional moves, and, and the two uh, must uh, appear in the compiler at, at some point. Now, what we have in uh, Calway is conditional uh, load and stores. And um, uh, we, we see again examples here. So because it's conditional, it's a kind of predicated uh, execution. Uh, here we see uh, what's happened with the load and the store. In both cases, you, you can only do that with a condexec uh, construct. So this is one uh, we, we have on Carré. And uh, one thing that will be uh, interesting afterward is that instead of having a, a predicate on the operand, which is just a general memory operand, we have something we call the mem simple uh, predicate here, which is explained here. It's a memory operand, which is either the referencing a pointer or, or is restricted to a simple addressing mode that is base register plus immediate offset, which can be quite big in our case. But this is different from the general case where you can have uh, index uh, addressing or index uh, scale addressing. This one exists. Uh, in non-predicated form. In predicated form, you can only do that one. And this is one of the uh, things we will have to deal with when we do if conversion. And, and it's not just Calre. For instance, the FRV architecture, which is another one doing if conversion GCC, has the same uh, kind of constraints. Now, a quick summary of, uh, of the uh, uh, GCC framework for if conversion. Uh, so, um, when you, uh, the framework for if conversion of GCC uh, is based on the, the condexec uh, construct when you deal with uh, predica fully predicated machines. So, uh, in that case, you would have to uh, write, in, in many cases, a lot of patterns for the regular execution, and then a big bunch of patterns explaining, uh, ex uh, exposing the case where you conditionally execute, that is, you predicate this instruction. When you have all your eyes there to predicate, it's quite heavy. So there is a mechanism uh, in a GCC called uh, define condexec, and define condexec, you just provide the uh, 
uh, kind of test that can be uh, applied to a conditional execution. Then you provide a piece of the uh, output template syntax. So this is the one we would use, for instance, for, for Carre, even though we will not be using it at Carre. Then if you have, have a, a fake move instruction here, so I describe the fake move instruction here, and I add uh, an attribute saying it's predicable. So when you have the predicable attribute, then the RTL expansion will say, oh, I will take this pattern and wrap it into a conde exec so you don't have to duplicate all your writing. So this is the, the basic uh, uh, infrastructure you have to uh, describe your conditional execution pattern in GCC. So now how does, uh, uh, how does the if conversion work in the GCC? In fact, he uh, has uh, three main paces and it's called C1, conditional execution. So C1, C2, C3. Uh, C1 is uh, before combine. Uh, C2 is uh, after uh, combine. And uh, uh, C3 is after reload. So in, both, in, in the two first cases, we have uh, pseudo registers. In the last case, we don't have, uh, only have uh, architectural uh, uh, harder, harder registers. And uh, so it's a fairly, so I, I just give a summary of the top uh, down structure because after I will explain where the target hooks uh, do something particular for, for or, or KVX port. So we just take the role function, iterate, uh, 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 find uh, if header that will return to you the header of a candidate basic block region. So it will be the test the, the, top lo the top most test of the region in general. And then uh, when it iterates until it gets null, and, and when, whenever it sees that someone has changed uh, the, the, uh, con the uh, data flow somewhere, it uh, redoes uh, the DF uh, analysis to be sure that uh, it's up to date. So it's a quite uh, uh, understandable uh, top level driver. Now the find uh, if header, uh, again, it's running uh, C1, C2, C3, but uh, it is here where you have, we have the first target hook, uh, if uh, CVT MACDEP in it. So this is where you will uh, put all the control to exploit uh, um, the if conversion for your port, and this is the main one. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and, for you, and, and once you have done uh, that, you see that the, the code pass is quite different whether you are before or after reload. So we can say that uh, the machine uh, will uh, work before or after, but it will be most, in most cases exclusive. So they will do a conditional move or no conditional execution only, or they will do mostly uh, predicated execution uh, uh, in C3. And um, this uh, uh, targeting of a work in a before after register allocation is based on the relay completed, but also the return of the uh, half conditional execution. And the half conditional execution is a target uh, hook where the documentation says don't do it unless you're doing multiple mode execution like a sum, uh, arm sum. But in fact, by default, it will return half conditional execution. And the half conditional execution, it, it's built automatically uh, when uh, the compiler compiles the pattern and see the conde exec uh, uh, template. So this is the uh, top level uh, function. Now, if we go to the no C find if block, it means no conditional execution. It means we'll do only uh, tricks with control flow by looking at dead values on some pass, or we'll uh, use a, a classic uh, conditional move with the form I, I, I display the, the if then else of the value and not the conde exec template. So you see that uh, it does uh, basically uh, filling info of the if conversion block try to uh, process in simple way. If it doesn't work, uh, try to process using conditional move. So this is exactly from the source uh, if cvt.c in the compiler, and the, the uh, commentary explain exactly what you're supposed to do. So we are here, uh, no C, so it's a before uh, 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 reload, before register location. Now we are in the other branch of the if conversion. We are after register allocation, and um, we will try to apply the compiler. We'll try to, to do conditional execution that is predicated execution 
on, on the machine it was uh, designed for. So here it will go in, into more work. It will fir first find to see if the regent is, is more than if than else. Is that uh, an end or, or kind of construct and we have a lot of branches and, and the, uh, uh, we have a common else block or common uh, 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 Zen block depending if it's uh, an end or, or or. And if it doesn't work, just go back to a uh, uh, region which are if then else and then go to a, a lower level function that, go, that will try really to uh, conditionally execute uh, the uh, if uh, conversion region. And so what it does here is that the top level function will uh, try to find in the if on the different branch of the if then else you have a common head and common tail, so, so as not to if convert them because it would be useless. And then the core, which is different between the, uh, the then and else, for instance, will, will be passed to the lower level function, uh, which is uh, called um, uh, process uh, instruction. And now we have the uh, process instruction here from start to end, that is f f the part which are not in common is uh, within, within uh, if, uh, sorry, the then and else branch. And then what it does, it, uh, try to build a pattern using a condexec and a test or the complement of the test depending on the branch and try to see if that is recognized as a valid uh, 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 instruction template. But before uh, validating the change, if it's a valid template, it just hand over to uh, another uh, target uh, hook, which is called if convert modify instruction. And this target hook can decide uh, I accept the new pattern, I change the pattern, or I, or I reject the, the if conversion by returning null into this uh, pattern. So this is uh, the second main hook we have to, uh, to go for the if conversion. So the, the first was initialization, done in CE1, CE2, CE3, and the other one uh, is uh, modify instruction only happen in C3 after restore location when you really try to use conditional execution with code exact pattern. Now, how are we going to extend that for our uh, target uh, architecture? We have a set of objectives and we have a set of uh, constraints. So first, uh, if conversion, there are many variants of it, but the, the most important one would say is what happened during uh, vectorization or auto-vectorization. So you can vectorize by hand, you can use uh, uh, a different kind of uh, conditional move, uh, select, uh, uh, merge, whatever, by hand, or the compiler can do it. So we are not going to compete against that. It's a very effective way. Then after, what doesn't come through uh, uh, manual or, or automatic vectorization, it can uh, fall into a few standard pattern names that you can uh, implement. In that case, you will have some form of if conversion. So the most important one is the move uh, mode uh, CC, means conditional. So it's uh, called even for vector and for scala uh, altogether. But it doesn't catch everything for a reason that I don't understand. And you also have other uh, more scalar oriented patterns where, in fact, it's a Gimple optimization that prepares the if conversion. You don't have to go into the uh, if conversion or, or at the RTL. So we want to complement that. So, in fact, you are working for scalar uh, if, if conversion for the opportunities that were missed by earlier uh, mechanism. And also, we constrain ourselves uh, at Carway. We never change the target independent part of, of GCC. Uh, maybe it's uh, too much of a constraint, but, but we can work uh, with that uh, until now. Now, what are the uh, objectives we are going to, to, to aim for? We would like to, to uh, predicate uh, conditional, uh, we would like to predicate load and store, which have a restricted addressing mode in case of a predication, which is the case because of a coding constraint on most machines that do partial uh, predication of instruction set. So it will not work if you have a complex addressing mode and the if uh, conversion does a code exec and of, uh, and of course it's not recognized. So first we want to work around that. Then we see that in, in uh, several cases, there are simple instructions uh, where you can uh, pseudo predicate them. This is, uh, so that is, you execute them, assuming there are no side effects, but the result go into a temporary register, and then you just conditionally move the temporary register. So in that case, you can extend the, uh, the regions that you could uh, if convert. 
And last, we uh, also uh, try to do speculative execution of instruction for spec speculative execution when you are in a if or else, in a then or else branch, and you see you only compute local value, they are not used elsewhere, they, are, they don't have a side effect, so you don't wait to pay the price of a pseudo predication with a conditional move, you just want to uh, compute this instruction uh, in its uh, target register and enable that in the if conversion, but in general it, it should not work, and the compiler doesn't do that by default. So. Uh, now, the constraint we have is that uh, this work in C3 after register allocation. So, uh, what we do, we have to prepare work before register allocation. Register allocation does a lot of things, and then we have to uh, recover the pieces and, and, uh, and work after register allocation. Uh, the, the, the main reason for that is not a weakness of GCC, it's because the state of the art for register allocation. Uh, with a predicated instruction. Uh, it's uh, very complex and it's uh, not mainstream. Uh, basically, the live range escape uh, the definition, which are not a uh, kill definition. So you have to analyze uh, your, your graph of values, uh, the webs, and put pseudo kills uh, and to constraints. So it's a hard. Uh, we did that at STMicro. It's hard to have a, a chat in Briggs allocator hack. Uh, uh, to, to manage uh, conditional uh, definitions. So it's a Kalan Koblenz in, in uh, GCC, but it would be the same. So it's a big simplification to do the predication after uh, register location. Now, uh, there are two ways to do that. One is the FRV way. Uh, try to scavenge, you use uh, hard register live uh, range holes and work with them. Or we can prepare uh, the work that we try to do here, uh, and then have register allocation, allocate variables, and then when we put the conditional or with pseudo predication or speculation, we don't break anything, and it's more tricky than uh, it would seem at first. So, uh, in fact, the modifications are, are not very extensive to GCC. Uh, first, there is a top-level control, which is the max conditional execute. So it's uh, just a cost of how many instructions in each branch are worth uh, converting to, uh, to, to a conditional execution. So uh, currently, we have a, a big number because we are pushing the uh, uh, optimization to its limits in, in validation. Then, like I mentioned earlier, we have the uh, MACDEP init, which is called in C1, C2, C3. And then at the end of CE3, when everything is okay uh, for if converting the region by, by condexec, then you call the uh, if CVT modify instruction. And uh, we also have the target uh, have conditional execution switch, which is used in various places. So in fact, we do not uh, use uh, the default implementation. So it's a very simple explanation. So uh, we have a big uh, max conditional execute. In the uh, MACDEP init uh, macro, uh, we capture internal variable uh, uh, of, uh, of the if converter of GCC, which is before or after combined, because it's internal variable that we can uh, get access to from this uh, hook. Then for the modify instruction, we return the pattern. It's a macro, but we return the, the result of the function. And finally, we implement a non-default have a conditional execution where it says uh, it's uh, reload uh, completed. So uh, in C1, C2, it will say, oh, I don't have uh, uh, predicated, so we'll do all the stuff for, for uh, non-conditional execution and conditional move only. And that after rest allocation, you say, oh, I have a fully predicated machine, let's go. So it's a very simple uh, uh, change. So um, I will summarize the code. I hope there is too much, uh, not too much code. So uh, the main thing is that we, comp we set a global variable called uh, if uh, CVT C level, are we in C1, C2, C3? OK, that's the main part. And then uh, in C1, uh, C, C3, we do nothing. In C2, uh, we do all the preparation work for C3, that will come later. But also, we take care that normal uh, C1 and C2 are, are not uh, 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 prevented from uh, doing the uh, normal work. And, and then uh, we, um, 
we find the candidate for C3. It's called uh, uh, candi C2 find, can find candidate for C3. So find candidate for C3 goes into the candidate blocks and does things like uh, do I have too many instructions, do I have side effect, uh, have a, do I have a, complete, uh, a complex uh, set statement, uh, no, no, no. And then I branch into four cases. One is uh, I do conditional move. And then if I have a, a mem, I try to uh, do a conditional uh, mem. And if not, I must be in arithmetic, including the ones that were rejected in the conditional move uh, normal form. And then I will try either to speculate or to do the pseudo conditional execution. So uh, another part is uh, I, on those four functions, I, I only uh, give a extract from the uh, conditional mem execution because uh, all the other are more or less subset of that one. So it looks complex, but what it does is say, uh, do I have a zero extension or not? Uh, then uh, it doesn't matter for, for conversion, but I want to, to get that. Uh, do, do I have um, a, real, a simple load and store? Okay, easy. And then do I have, so this is a, a predicate, so just in predicate.md, but we, we call it here. And it says, do, do I have a simple memory operand? that is only a base or base plus offset, or do I, do I have the general memory operand? And if I have a simple memory operand, I do a wrapping of uh, this uh, pattern into a parallel with uh, one, the original pattern, and two, a clobber of a pseudo register to have some re register space to work uh, with uh, later. And then I put into a table uh, this uh, instruction because I will reuse in case I, I want really to, uh, uh, if convert, I will re reuse this uh, pattern. And then I go into recognition, I recognize uh, this way, either the original one or the one with wrapping uh, with a, a parallel, and, and, and I go. Now I've prepared my block, now I'm back to the main initialization part, and uh, now the job is uh, I want to uh, have my live range handy when I will be after register location. In FRV, for instance, they do not uh, try to insert just the register use in the test condition. So depending on the, uh, what's happened uh, with register location, the operand may or may not be available after register location because the register has been reused. Here, we just first uh, pull the live range. This is not in pseudo code, but that's the first step here. And then after, we want to make sure that we will have pseudo predication and, and speculated instructions that we have <coughs> real register definition after register location. Uh, we don't want those uh, real definition to kill useful full value. And in fact, it's quite uh, of a of a extensive uh, check to do. And so, uh, what we do is that we uh, pull the, the live range, we introduce uh, pseudo def, and we uh, introduce use in the test block in the joint block, and so we will have uh, interference with the value going on the other branch of the what we are going to uh, pseudo predicate, and we have the uh, value still available in the harder register. And um, for the speculative instruction, we don't have the scratch register and, 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 and space, but we, have, uh, we need to do some, something else. We first need to put a flag to say later, don't put a cond exec around this pattern. So currently, I'm not very satisfied with what we do, but I just attach a, a reg non-negative note to the instruction, so it will be carried around. Non-neg note is usually it's only meant to, uh, to help with the mapping of do loops. Uh, on some architecture, but, but it is not needed in architecture. So it's a note which is very harmless, and we can carry it uh, around. Uh, we could do a parallel with another useless or, or, or inspect instruction, but currently we do with uh, the uh, non-reg note. So we just flag those, saying, uh, don't uh, if put the cond exit around them later. And also we say um, uh, the destination register uh, we extend the live range because we don't want, uh, again, that it uh, will mess around with the value carried by, by other uh, paths of the control flow. And, 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 and finally, the other, uh, so we are finished with the first target hook. The second target hook is uh, if convert modify instruction. And this is where we see in action that we get the pattern and given by, by the, uh, uh, the uh, 
if conversion of GCC, we get, have the odd pattern. First, we see is that uh, things we introduce to extend the live range, we, we just uh, don't care about it. Uh, it will be removed later. And then uh, if we have a flag of uh, uh, it's uh, speculated, don't uh, put uh, the cond exec. So in fact, do not uh, get the pattern from here, but return the old pattern. Now, we are, we are finished with the C part. And there will be a couple slides on the uh, uh, templates. So we have the templates for the road store with a, a simple addressing mode. So this one will be wrapped with condexact and will work out of the box. Now what happens if the if converter in C3 comes and, and will wrap uh, an instruction which has uh, the gen general addressing mode? It will not work. So the pattern we supplied is a wrapping like I was described with a set and a clobber. Currently, we could wrap with another thing than a clobber, but that's the idea. And then it uh, just uh, rely on splitting to produce uh, a variant where we have computed the effective address in the, in the scratch register and then uh, fall back to the simpler condexed template, which is recognized by default uh, in, the, in our description. But then later, at the end, if uh, we could uh, if convert, we have to undo this wrapping. So we have another family of patterns that undo the wrapping we did to prepare for pseudo uh, uh, predication. So you have the example here. For the stores, is the same. Uh, for the loads I mentioned, we have to duplicate all that for the uh, small uh, size load uh, with a zero and, and, and sign extension. For the, for the uh, arithmetics, it's a little bit uh, different because we don't have to, uh, uh, no, sorry, it's, on, on this part, it's uh, mostly uh, the same. And so we, we degrade the, uh, the computation into uh, computing into the scratch uh, register and, and, um, and conditionally executing. Donc, so, so we have this, uh, we have the, we have the, the uh, effect of a pseudo uh, predi predication here. And again, we have a, a companion pattern to undo the wrapping with parallel that was done before. You don't see parallel here because it's a defined uh, ENSN and it has an implicit parallel over it, but that's the same ID. And, and then we are finished. Uh, we just uh, have to take care of the cleanup. And the cleanup, uh, what we have to do, First, we uh, eliminate all the remaining uh, pseudo def uh, we introduce. The pseudo use are not uh, concerned, so we just uh, uh, split them into uh, use. And then uh, uh, we have to be sure that uh, this uh, last uh, splitting is done before uh, the machine dependent reorg. And for us, machine dependent reorg, the key is a uh, do loop optimization and the uh, schedule, which does uh, scheduling and bundling. So we do that. So these are the, the, the key part of the uh, if conversion. Now, <clears throat> what do we get uh, as a result? So we have a simple case here, and uh, we see <clears throat> we have uh, an instruction. Uh, we want to predicate. We have something that will be conditional move, and we have uh, something where we have to compute uh, something from a load and then uh, use that as an, as an address. And so we run the uh, optimization, and it says conditional move the number 14, uh, sorry, me conditional memory, conditional move, uh, memory arithmetic, which is speculative, not conditional, and, and do the uh, conditional mem. So these are the uh, instruction numbers that you can find here with the DP uh, output uh, of assembly code. So this explains, but most interesting is what happened. With, uh, this is without the if conversion, this is before. And we, you see the conditional branch here. It goes here, or it uh, falls through. After, we have that. So we have a more parallel execution. And uh, we have the simple uh, predication in green. And we have the pseudo predication uh, of conditional mem here. So you see, uh, we cannot do um, complex addressing mode. So we have uh, add a scale by eight to uh, compute the effective address, and it goes into here. Uh, same for this load. It goes uh, R5. It's uh, called here. So 
the pseudo predication has created additional computation. Speculative arithmetic is as is, there is no overhead, and this is a plain conditional uh, uh, load that didn't need uh, pseudo predication, it's directly supported by the ISA. So uh, I have other examples, but I uh, will go quick. Now, even though I, I mentioned it's not for vector loops, uh, our, our, our real goal is, the, is to pipeline uh, scale uh, loops with uh, y, uh, y conditions, with conditionals, and by using um, uh, non-trapping uh, memory accesses. So uh, you see that it uh, identifies uh, conditional arithmetic. Another case where I should mention that we have to compile by setting uh, ignore finite arithmetic and other flags, so it will pass, uh, has no side effect speculate for floating point. But that's a detail. Here, splitting conditional memory. Here, doing conditional arithmetic. This is interesting. We didn't see that before. So the, the multiply here we will do uh, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a pseudo uh, conditional way, in a pseudo predicated way, and then uh, you have the end here. So uh, to summarize. Uh, we've been working and we implemented the SCARIF conversion for uh, a partially predicated uh, VLIW architecture, the KVX architecture. We believe this uh, architecture is not idiosyncratic. It has uh, a lot of modern ideas, starting with vector scala uh, in the, in the ISA. Uh, it's uh, uh, an illustration that uh, 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 classic VLIW as opposed to, to epic style of VLIW can be efficiently com compiled for. You don't need the full predication and the heavy weight on ISA encoding that comes with it. Um, so if, and uh, it was a good uh, a return that uh, the existing if conversion framework of GC was robust and, and, and configurable enough to accommodate those changes. And uh, we activated before and after reload, as opposed to on most machines, only before or only after. Um, when we compare to what uh, previously existed, uh, first in the 90s, you've been a series of development for, for conditional moves, so that was Blickstein with the gem compiler in 92, 91. Then was the RK algorithm uh, by Schlansker and the, uh, another algorithm by, by Jesse Fang at Intel, uh, both for the IS64, we use those uh, algorithms. I use them myself in a previous uh, ST chips. That was fully predicated, and this is after we decide we will not do full predication on the carry machine. And uh, the original uh, support for uh, compiler support for, for predicated, f uh, partially predicated machines, that is the trust um, uh, machine in the multi-flow compiler, was uh, done by uh, Steph Stefan Fredenberger. So he was a colleague of mine when we were working on the, on the LX uh, ST200 compiler at ST Micro. And, uh, and then you have the SSA form uh, of if conversion. So you need extension to uh, SSA form, or you need special handling of out of SSA uh, when you want to have the uh, uh, conditional execution seen at, at level of SSA form. But uh, I, I don't uh, know of compiler uh, using that uh, currently. And the, another category is after register location, and I would say uh, uh, GCC shines uh, with regard to what exists uh, for uh, after register allocation, and it's a working in uh, IS64, CC6, F FRV, and marginally for other targets like uh, ARC and the ARM uh, RR32, and then we, we could add to the list uh, KVX uh, if we ever happen to be upstream, which we would like to. Now, the key feature of the work is that we've introduced uh, pseudo predication and uh, local uh, speculative execution, and all that uh, works afterwards the location. The key part, uh, which is uh, central correct to correctness, is to be sure that every computation we do on scratch register or on local register in case of speculation will not uh, clobber values which are supposed uh, to be carried around when the control flow was there. And that was a tricky part uh, to, to get uh, right. And uh, if we compare to a machine that has a port mostly similar, the F FRV also have a restriction on the addressing modes uh, when they uh, predicate them. 
and uh, they do uh, they have a very complex machinery which is more complex in the uh, 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 lines of source code than what we did uh, to uh, uh, recover all the unused uh, part of hard register they could uh, put to profit to compute uh, the effective address and they also forget to extend the live range of the register used in, the, in, in branch. So in most cases, it has been reallocated. It's no, no longer available. <coughs> so for the next step, um, we, it's uh, too bad we cannot reuse the uh, defined condexec machinery. This is very uh, useful, but it can only work if uh, you have a real uh, instruction, uh, defined instruction patterns. If you have a defined instruction and split like we need currently for the uh, pseudo predication, then uh, it cannot apply, at least to my knowledge. So uh, we did most of the pattern you, you, you saw in extract by hand, but next step is that we will uh, script the output uh, of, uh, of the MD dump and, 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 uh, and see an attribute and then uh, uh, create uh, the uh, pseudo predicator uh, template for it. And to conclude, uh, this is mostly targeted to uh, Scala loops and pipelining of Scala loops of while loops. And so uh, we'll have a lot of uh, first uh, uh, complete the pipelining of uh, while loops uh, with the uh, non-trapping loads and, and then uh, have this as an en enabler. And then we'll see exactly uh, how, how we tune the, uh, in particular, the size of the uh, if conversion code. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, I know that it, in the last couple of years we haven't seen this architecture that much, the VLIW, and it's notable for being very hard to write compilers for. Uh, we have seen before some failures on the Intel side, on AMD side, <coughs> with Xeon Phi, TerraScale. My question is, have you done some performance uh, benchmarking on this compared to a traditional CPU design, GPU, where it stands? Yes, of course. <clears throat> so we compare a lot uh, for compute uh, benchmark against uh, ARM and x86. So with the current compiler, we see that, that uh, if we have the same clock cycle, that is, uh, uh, let's say, one gigahertz, uh, we, are, we take uh, between uh, th three and, and nine more clock cycles than the equivalent code compiled with the same uh, uh, compiler with GCC of LLVM of the same maturity. So, but we have a, a much simpler implementation. So, uh, and this uh, uh, derating of uh, X3, this is uh, compared to uh, X86 and Ryzen uh, kind of machine, AMD uh, Ryzen. Uh, compared to uh, uh, advanced uh, ARM architecture at clock cycle, we are twice uh, uh, less efficient. So it will take uh, twice the amount of clock cycle. So this is the general result we see after uh, using a, a wide range of uh, numerical image and signal processing uh, application running on those because our, cost, our, our customer come with, I want to offload this computation. And, and uh, so we have many core, we consume less, we have uh, less silicon, and in most cases, uh, we, we uh, make for the uh, time two or time three the rating uh, by the number of cores. Hi, thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Have you done any extra optimization before the if conversion? to favorize uh, your uh, predication. So I'm thinking like three com um, conversions, um, three modifications to make your, uh, <coughs> let's say, predication kick in more often. Um, in fact, we've seen other things. We've seen, for instance, that that was one of the motivation uh, of this work. We had to disable uh, tree thinking at the GIMPL level because it will uh, remove opportunities uh, for the conditional move optimization, the default one. So we didn't want to have this drawback. So our objective was whatever is done before, we don't want to uh, meddle around with the uh, optimization. We take the code as is and we try to improve uh, with what we have. So we, we don't change uh, code uh, upstream.
Okay, so I think no other questions. So thank you for uh, for your presentation and and that's all. Thank you.
Zkouška, test, test, one, two, three. Okay, tak. Tak. Když zůstaneš tady mezi těma dvěma, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. přibližně. OK. Případně, kdyby se chtěl chodit, tak se dá přenastavit. Super, v pohodě. Tak jo, díky. So apparently no one else is coming. All right, so welcome to the Sphinx documentation BOF. So even though it's a, it's a BOF session, I would like to first present a couple of slides and a small demonstration of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of what I converted. So it's, uh, the BOF is about documentation which we have and what we can improve. So at the beginning, let's realize what, what we have. So we have web pages, uh, which mainly contain some um, development information, really cycle uh, information about uh, how to contribute to the project, uh, about coding style, style of uh, changes. Uh, for git commits, and it also contains information like what's the currently supported set of C++ features, for instance, which is updated by uh, Marek Poláček, for instance. So it's one part. The second part, which, are, which I'm mainly interested in, is the tech info documentation, which uh, contains of two parts. The first one is the user-level documentation. It's the, it's the documentation which uh, GCC consumers or people who use it oh, yeah, visit the, 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 the most time. And the second part is for, for us, it's for developers who, who would like to know the internals of, of GCC and uh, how to, how to yeah, write a new port or how to write a new pass, stuff like that. And the last part is uh, GCC wiki which also contains information about projects, mainly. For instance, as, as David showed, he uses uh, wiki pages for status of analyzer. He links issues, he links uh, new features. He, yeah, he also writes some kind of uh, changes, uh, changes. changes. Yeah, minor, or in detail, how the changes. And we, it also contains some uh, API documentation. For instance, LTO plugin is documented there, and it's also used for LTO offloading, if I'm correct. You also use it for some documentation. So all of these are documentation which, which we have in, in, some, in some way. And yeah, we, we combine formats, so for web pages it's obvious, it's HTML, for Wikipedia it's also obvious, it's a, it's yeah, wiki markdown, and the rest, the tech info is written in the tech info, and we uh, output that into multiple output formats, like manual pages, info pages, and HTML and PDF. So that's, that's, that's what the output. And uh, it's, it's good to realize who are the stakeholders of the documentation. So, so first, it's users, and they typically don't write the documentation, they consume it, so they are the, the biggest consumer of the documentation. So if you, if you realize, or if you have comments about documentation, it's, it's good to realize that we write the documentation as, as developers, but we are not a typical consumer of the documentation because we, yeah, we are very skilled, users of, uh, 
of, docu of the documentation which we, which we write. And the last category are some package maintainers, people who build toolchain. So these people are interested in installation section, for instance. They would like to know about how to configure, build, test uh, the project. So that's, that's about you know, stakeholders. And I will, I will now show uh, a few examples what, what a typical user can, can do. So example number one is you are a consumer of, of, of GCC and you would like to know what options are enabled at O2. It's, it's, a, yeah, it's a reasonable request for documentation. So, so if, you, if you open the HTML documentation, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. So one option is going to the index at the very end and then finding, uh, oh, so, yeah, it works. If you write O2, it doesn't work, so you have to remove the leading uh, dash and then you eventually find it. And there's a list of, of the options which uh, are enabled by O2. So, so now the question is, I would like to know what each of these actually means. So that's that, 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 that's problem. So um, second option, how you can, you, can, you can search for it. You can use Google. And as you can see, you will land in the very same uh, web page. But in this case, for GCC 3.4, which is, which is probably yeah, old. So, so this is not ideal. Uh, so now I'm opening the Sphinx migrated documentation, and I'm going to do the very same. I will just write O2. And there's a built-in index capability, and I can see that the first result is some program option, which I'm interested in. If I open it, uh, it will yeah, point me directly to the place where it's defined, and I have, I have uh, references to individual options which are mentioned at O2. If I, if I open a PDF version of, of the migrated documentation... So I, I don't want to detract, because I think this is good, but you could have had links in the tech info, because it, it, you've actually had to change this now to add links in here in Sphinx. Now, I know it's easy to do in Sphinx because it'll do it automatically for you, but the point is that's, that's a property of you've done the documentation better rather than directly being a property of using Sphinx. So, 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 so even now in Tech Info, you, 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 can, you can achieve the, the, the links. That's what, what if, you're, you're saying. If you want to. Yes. You, you've done better documentation. That's great. But it's not because it's Sphinx. Joseph? Does think Sphinx so solve the problem of Google finding an old version of the documentation. So I was wondering, do you have an idea about how you might do something like, say, the Python documentation does of having a link pointing out, this is an old version, and here's the links to the corresponding documentation from a more recent version? Because that sort of thing, which maybe is a bit orthogonal to the build tools, linking to the current version seems like what you might want to address the issue of Google finds an old version. Yeah, the, the answer is that, for instance, uh, if you know the Read the Docs web page, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a hosting platform for documentation using the Sphinx. And you can have different versions of documentation, and there's a, there's a toolbox showing you, okay, this is obsolete version, the stable version is this one, and there's a yeah, warning saying that you might want to jump to the latest ver version of documentation. But th the problem with the, with, the, with the versioning is that we, we list all the documentation. So, so, so the issue is probably uh, how we list all the versions of uh, like this. This is probably the problem that we list all the in individual old versions of documentation, at, and Google is probably unhappy about uh, about them. Yeah, CMake actually has got a really good way of doing that. When you search for something, and Google gives you CMake 3.3, at the top of the page, there's a 
a pop-up which allows you to pick any version of CMake you want to look at. So if we could implement something like that, it would be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> but perhaps we, for that page, we could just move the uh, no longer supported GCC versions to a separate page and add some attributes to, for, for Google not to search it. Uh, or yes. <laughs> we can improve it. Yeah, I wanted to show that, that, that probably now people use Google to search the, the, the options because the, the other option which I showed is it's, it's, yeah, it's clunky, it's, it's, it's not pleasant. So probably they use Google because of that. Uh, Martin, there were yes. two more advantages that I, maybe you're about to cover this. Um, but if I'm, say, someone asks me a question on IRC about, you know, how do I do this in GCC? And I want to tell them, oh, use, I don't know, dash, optimi dash f optimize trillen. And I, you know, I'm, and I, I'm, I've got it, the docs in front of me. I click on it. Okay, how do I tell the user? Uh, well, first of all, what is the URL look like if you click on that on one, on one of them? Uh, if you if you click if, yeah if you click on it it's command option yeah as opposed to I guess index equals um, I can't remember the, the exactly what is the URL good a good URL is human readable and memorable and doesn't change and I can't mm -hmm. remember all the other properties of a good of a good URL and currently the tech in, the tech info generated HTML URLs kind of suck in places um, especially if they contain punctuation. Um, well, it's dash index dash dash, yeah, um, I th I possibly one's, maybe it's fixed up, I'm not sure, maybe I'm being unfair. But also, if you go back to the, 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 the Sphinx generated HTML, you'll notice that if you hover next to it, there's a, it gives you a really handy permalink. So when someone asks me a question in IRC, and I, look at, and I think, oh, I'm pretty sure it's that, and then I can, I can copy and paste that URL and paste that into, the, into yeah. IRC and say it's here, and then they can go straight to the doc. Um, whereas, if you look at the tech info generated documentation of the same, and say I found it, I, um, well, say I hadn't looked it up, I'm just scrolling down the page, and it's like, how do I get the, the link for that? And I have to do a view source and find the, what's the anchor called? Yeah. And it's just, and the, and the link is not precise because, yeah. because yeah, this should be at the very top of the page, and yeah. it's not. And when, I'm, and when I'm writing, I mean, for libgcc JIT, I'm using, um, I mean, ah, yeah, okay. I, I've been using Sphinx from the beginning, and it's so much nicer when I'm writing my release notes for when I want to talk about something, and I can, and I'm, I'm paste a URL into the release notes, and people say it's it's here. Whereas if I was using Tech Info, it, I, I wouldn't bother because it would just be too much work. Um, I feel. Um, I have a long rant about all this, but I'll yeah, I, I have a few, few comments about your libgcc documentation. So, so, so back to the the PDF version. So you have you have lists of O2 options. I will zoom in a bit. And what, what's, what's, what's nice that you have the references and they are precise. So for instance, I can, I can hover over it and I can see directly what's, what's meaning of the, of the option. So I can, I can like, yeah, very quickly identify what's each option about. Is this the, the Sphinx generated PDF? Yes, and yes. Is this, sorry. And is, this is the Sphinx generated PDF. And is this, is this a Vince you're using, which um, I, think, I think that's a Vince, isn't it, the doc viewer? Yeah, I think that hover thing is a, is a property of the viewer that you're using. Um, so this is, this is a Vince uh, PDF viewer, and yeah. it's capable of, the, the web browser built in uh, PDF viewer is not capable of these, uh, of these links. OK, so, so that's. Uh, that's that's the example of number one. Uh, what else? Yeah, for instance, we have we have very many options which are target dependent. For instance, M long call. And what's 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 interesting that this option is defined for multiple targets, each having probably different different meaning, different uh, details. So so I I use. Uh, yeah, the Sphinx offers 
program scope. So you define a name of program, and there you have a set of options. So I'm abusing this feature a bit. So I'm. You can see that there's a list of all the all the targets which which define the m long call option. So so the option is so is, is actually documented multiple times. So for each target, different meaning. And if you want to have a cross reference, so you, you must be precise, saying, okay, I would like to link to this target m call option. So it's it's a nice feature of uh, how you can define a uh, of like multiple times. It's, it's, it's the very same what we have for function attributes, variable att attributes, that there, we have target dependent uh, attributes, and they are defined multiple times, having different meaning, and if you want to make a link to a proper one, so you need some scoping. So that's, that's, that's the second demonstration. Uh, as, as David mentioned, so, so we, so, I'm suggesting using Sphinx, but we are using Sphinx because uh, libgcc documentation is written in Sphinx, and Ada has three manuals which are also written in Sphinx, and then these manuals are converted to TechInfo like, automatically by, by by Sphinx, and eventually being uh, yeah uploaded to the uh, website which we have. So 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 we use Sphinx. So. What's nice, for instance, about uh, the uh, libgcc JIT that it contains a lot of tutorials. So if I open one of them, uh, so so it's it's mixture of examples, uh, code snippets, uh, and what's what's quite nice that you, ha you you can have a C expression with which contains some types or enum values, and uh, you can you can click. To the definition of, of the of the type, so it's uh, it's a nice feature how you can not only document functions but you can also have expressions where the content can be also documented and you get uh, links for free. So that's uh, that's quite useful and uh, yeah. So there's some. So, so Sphinx offers syn syntax highlighting for uh, languages, also for assembly output, and uh, what's what's nice about uh, examples, for instance, that you, you can you can have a separate file which is included by a directive. So, in in your case, it can be a a, a test suite uh, file which you include into the documentation, so you still know the the the, the test or the the example works on one hand, and on the other, on the other hand, you can you can include it in the documentation, or you can take a part of, of the of the file and include it in the documentation, and uh, yeah, document how how uh, the library works. Okay, so that's that's about the uh, about the demonstration. I can I can show more examples if you will be interested in uh, in any topic. So, so summarizing uh, the limitation. So, as already mentioned, it's about navigation, search capability. Uh, the, the, the formatting is quite poor. We we don't use much visual visual yeah aspects of HTML. We can we, we can theoretically use. Uh, yeah, the link anchors are poor. Uh, that's about the, the, the precise position where you can get and uh, the URL, as, most, as was mentioned. Uh, yeah, missing cross references. So it's we, for instance, use keywords for options or for I don't know files, uh, items, this kind of stuff. But 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 TechInfo is is not doing many cross references, as as showed in case of uh, the O2 options, which are linked. Uh, yeah, uh, code highlighting is probably possible via some external program. Oh, my microphone, please. Actually, for the internals manual, I don't think Google is a workaround. I, it's only possible to search for developer stuff by actually printing out the PDF, or having a PDF and searching in that. If you tried to search for... Uh, 
you know, some kind of a tree type using Google. It would just be crazy. Yeah. You mean the in internal GCC documentation which we have? I know it's 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 exception that's uh, at the risk of opening a can of worms and you listed at the beginning of your slides I think three different kinds of information there's a fourth that strikes me as um, doxygen or auto generating API documentation direct from the code and you didn't even mention that but I think you are, you have us a, a doxage or one of, or maybe it's one of your colleagues. It's it's maybe lip a CDC plus plus seals. Yeah, okay. uh, one that um, that is used. But um, I, one of the SUSE, one of you was or had a had a auto updated doxage. Yeah, that's build. That, that's that's me. But that's, yeah, <laughs> sorry, um, I know what you mean. Because I have all now we're using I've got all my internal C plus plus APIs and I don't want to write a bunch of oh, this is this class and this is this. no just get it from the class hierarchies from the code. Um, but that, this is maybe, uh, maybe I'll just uh, I'll put that stone back down and we can <laughs> not bother about that. Sorry. So, okay, I'll lift the stone back up again. I think, so on the, on the doxygen, I think we looked at this in the past. Isn't the problem that the GFDL and the GPL are incompatible? And we had pushback that you're not allowed to include stuff from the code. The, 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 I can't remember where we tripped over that. Now. Hopefully we can grow up and get past that and uh, fix that because it's a stupid objection. Yeah. No one's trying to do anything bad. What I really wanted to ask the question was about is you had a really good last example with some really good examples. And the number of manuals I've read, and actually GCC is better than most on this, but where you try the example out and no one's updated it and it doesn't work on the latest version of the compiler. And I know something that I think the LLVM people have looked at, I don't know how far they got with it, is actually testable documentation. And you can do it with uh, Sphinx because this can be an external file. And so long as you stick to a strict discipline of any file that you reference actually is executable. And then you can just do a make check documentation and you can make sure that all your examples work. And that fixes that problem in a, rather than we do it manually at the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, basically I'm hash include, well, not hash include, but the Sphinx direct, RST directive for include from the Deja GNU um, test suite. Uh, and um, uh, maybe I should confess that when I, com uh, pr when I contributed the libgcc documentation, the license at the top is not the GFTL, and no one noticed or complained. Um, <laughs> but that it's... on video. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been however many years now, um, but uh, yeah, shouldn't have said it's, that. It's uh, free documentation license. So um, I am the, the Linux kernel documentation maintainer, the guy who inflicted Sphinx upon the kernel community. So I came here mostly in case you have any questions, but I, would just, I just wanted to address the test coverage thing, because it wouldn't be that hard to write an extension module that runs and tests, does the tests as part of the docs build. You know, if you really wanted to be hardcore about that, you could do that. And um, it would be pretty easy to do. One of the nice things about Sphinx is the extensibility of it. For that, I think it would be nice to have some markup that whether the test is complete, uh, compilable, linkable, and, and so on, like we have the uh, Dejagnu directives somewhere, and, and then don't show those directives in, in the documentation. But for instance, in, in OpenMP, uh, in the, in the uh, test suite, uh, test, uh, well, uh, OpenMP examples document is also generated by having tests on the side, and, each of them is marked whether it's, it's just a snippet showing something and not really compilable or if it's full test and you can link it or and in which language and, and so on. Yeah, so, so, so the motivation for moving to Sphinx uh, so number one is addressing all limitations I, I showed previously. Second is that we already use it. So 
<laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit funny. Uh, about the syntax, it's, it's, it's a markup language, I would say, somehow similar to, to TechInfo. It's, it's, it's not a dog book, fancy XML complex stuff. It's fairly simple for people who write code and need to document stuff. And uh, yeah, it was proved to be useful by Python community, I guess, and uh, kernel is also using Sphinx, and there's uh, yeah, entire project, it's called Redux, it, it's hosting, apparently it's 100,000 document, doc, uh, documentations from different projects, so it's, it's, a, it's a quite huge ecosystem. Uh, yeah, there are some limitations, definitely. So, so the first one is that we, we combine somehow automatic, we, we, we migrate the documentation out, automatically, plus we, yeah, I, I made a bunch of manual changes. So it, the documentation still may contain errata. Uh, instead of a few huge files, which we have right now, we will have hundreds of files because, because of uh, how Sphinx works. It's basically one web page maps to one RST file. So if you have, if you have smaller uh, uh, pages, then these are quite small files. Uh, yeah, developers need to learn the new syntax. Uh, that's that's drawback. Uh, yeah, we will probably lose somehow the history because of uh, Git blame. Well, what, I mean, an advantage is that new developers don't have to learn tech info anymore, and new developers, no. <laughs> I think, are, are much more likely to know restructured text because so many other projects are using it. But yeah, yeah, for newcomers, it's definitely a benefit. Martin, you've, you've just had up an example of a Sphinx version of the GCC manual. Have you done the conversion? Yes. Okay, so, okay, right, so you've done most of the work anyway. Yeah, so... so How, and that went okay, because you've talked about all the problems, but that all looked quite good that you'd got. Yeah, it's... It, yeah, it's... I don't know, it's... Uh, I, I made a, a couple of proofreading rounds around documentation. Uh, yeah, it's. I'm quite clear. I'm. I'm. I'm quite sure it's. Yeah, in a in a good shape. It's not. It's not. It's not broken or completely broken. There are some minor, smaller formatting formatting issues. So we mainly speak about visual defects, let's say, in the documentation, not about. Yeah. Textual ones. So so as I mentioned, the Git blame would be harder. We have some scripts which upload the documentation. I can I can modify them. Uh, yeah, we, we we'll get new Sphinx warnings because of uh, yeah some some stuff. For instance, the we we document attributes multiple times, as mentioned. So I, I need to create probably target specific attribute names. Uh, yes, there are some projects that are emerging. They are they are they, they would like to be merged into 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 upstream, and they might have some tech info documentation. So for for Rust, it's not a problem. I know, I know. But for Modula 2, there's there's the documentation with con which contains um, a couple of hundred pages. And uh, we'll eventually get a new dependency for packagers of GCC because the, the Sphinx is, yeah, it's using Python stack. So instead of, or apart from Perl, which, which we depend on now, we will also need uh, Python. Uh, yeah, some some extra benefits. So so number one is uh, yeah, Sphinx contains a bunch of extensions. The useful one is so-called intersphinx, and it allows you to cross-reference in between manuals. So for instance, we have installation manual, and yeah, we have we have the the GCC manual, and we have a couple of cross-references saying if you want this option, you have to enable this configure option. So it's it's example of cross-references. Uh, or you have uh, mm -mm, libgomp referencing some, some, some stuff. 
So, so this is a nice benefit, and it also works in PDF, because PDF points to the HTML version of, of, the, of the corresponding cross manual. Uh, the, uh, there are Sphinx themes. Uh, we have many options, so I, I selected yeah, the, the I selected this one because I I was fine with the with the visual visual presentation. Uh, we can we can change it if we want. It contains nice features like a link checker, so it basically takes all the URLs in the in the in the manual and it verifies that that the URL still exists or if it's redirected or permanently redirected. So you can get this type of information. So for instance, Fortran manual contains yeah some removed links links because yeah it's an old project. Uh, yeah, we can get a new output format for. Mm, yeah, EPUB, which is a, which is a, some reader format, if I'm if I'm correct. And yeah, we can eventually, as 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 mentioned at the very beginning, we have we have uh, also documentation at web pages, so we can maybe migrate some of them into into Sphinx as well. For instance, the changes and porting, which is which is mainly listing new options. So you can get nice references. You can have code snippets, examples. So it's all much better doable in Sphinx than in pure HTML. So that's one candidate. Or we can, I don't know, we can include supported C++ features in a, in a table into the document as well. We have many options for, for, for this. Microphone, please. Yeah. So I think what would help people most is if you have a way to write documentation that, that you can see what you're doing, so what you see is what you get kind of situation, and also has the right markup, so it's compatible with the documentation that's already there. Is there a mechanism for doing that that you're aware of that's either open source or readily available? No. Well. Uh, about the migration, how, 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 is, how it's done. So we do it, we do it by exporting Makeinfo into XML, and then David started um, a converter, conversion tool which migrates that to uh, Sphinx. So that's how we do it. I was thinking maybe of new documentation. New documentation. So if you write new documentation, you would like to see the equivalent in, uh, in TechInfo? Yeah, you know, most of the people um, many people now are used to what you see is what you get kind of editors. So if we were able to set something up which had the right markup for GCC documentation, but the, as you generate the documentation, you can see how it's going to look, I think that might actually help new contributors quite a bit. So do you mean some uh, being able to compile a snippet of documentation to how it looks? Yeah, there are some definitely some tools, but... Does it, does well, it? There's a restructured text mode in Emacs anyway, which gives you a rough idea what it's going to look like. And also, um, your, choose your favorite repository hosting tool typically will display restructured text reasonably competently. So, okay, it's not as you see it, but you can push it and view it, and it'll, it'll show up quite good. Um, and uh, I mean, I write quite a lot of restructured text, and it is a lot easier than I write a lot of tech info as well, and yeah. it's, it's a lot easier than tech info and a lot more flexible. Okay, so there are two points to what I'm saying. One point is the ease of seeing what it's going to look like. That's the, what you see is what you get. But the second point was making sure that it's got the right markup in it, so that when the person submits the patch, it's going to be reasonably acceptable. Is there like a way of getting a, a profile? Like uh, having warnings and errors of, of the... Of the of the written documentation, you mean? I'm, I'm still not saying the right thing. What I mean is, like, if you had a CSS kind of thing that gave you, the, gave you all the formatting that was going to be acceptable for GCC, it would be much, much less chance of making a mistake in doing the documentation and then having to repeat it. Yeah. You can do it. I mean, have you looked at restructured text? I mean, the, the simplicity of it is such that that I think a lot of these style questions don't really come up. Um, it's, there's, there's not a lot you can do in a sense, uh, unless you really want to get into fancy things. 
I mean, the other thing is every generated HTML page actually has a link to show you the source, the restricted text source. So it might even be yeah, this a bit dark and difficult to read there, but there should be a link. Yeah, the, the, this 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 this, con source. this concrete theme doesn't show it, but I can I can okay. I can tweak it. Yeah, it's it's common for if, um, if I if I open, for instance, the uh, kernel uh, documentation, they are using very standard uh, uh, theme. If I open a random page, I can click view uh, page source, and I I see how it looks like. I think all this shows is that one of the first documents you need to write is an introduction to Sphinx for people who've learned tech info. Because yes. that's, that's always any new technology, that's the first document you want anyway. Yeah, I actually, I actually, uh, I, I, I wrote a chapter into the internal documentation, uh, which is uh, this one. If you write Sphinx, yeah, you get building documentation. I, I, I took, yeah, there's about dependencies, and there are some basic examples taken from, yeah, it's basically taken from um, kernel documentation, and yeah. So yes, we can definitely include some introduction to Sphinx pages which already exist, and. A lot of patch submitters do seem to be extremely bad in tech info at things like ensuring various constructs say command line option names are marked up properly, or for that matter, ensuring options, configure options, etc. for a document is at all and so on. So I don't really expect people to be much better or worse at doing that sort of thing in the Sphinx. If you want to make them better at it, I'd have thought that what we probably need is not so much some WYSIWYG thing as a sufficiently reliable way of checking for things without false, po without false positives, that you could have some test that points out automatically there are these things that you've missed documenting, mm. there are these things that are not marked up properly, because you can approximate with various things with GVEP, but that tends to have lots of false positives as well. That, that, that's the same for if you send a patch, you introduce new tests, and you don't have any guarantee that the test actually works because the person claimed that the person bootstrapped and run test suite. So it's, it's the same what we have my, with... Uh, my feeling is there's, le there's less semantic variation, actually, in the directives in, in Sphinx. So there's less to get confused about, is it a command or a keyword, uh, which, which does make it easier. But the great thing is, now you've converted the entire manual, which is the biggest document I think we have, then it's not difficult to pull out the entire set of constructs you've used, and there'll only be about 15 or 20 of them, put them in the front, in the internals manual, and that, that's the subset that you need. Yes. I have a, I mean, my, I have a personal argument on this, which is that, um, and the, the, <laughs> this may be turning into a rant, but every time I'm working on documentation, if I'm working on tech info, I find, I'm just, I'm gonna get this done quickly, I'm gonna go in, do what I need to do and get out, because the result is just, it's, it's a chore. When I'm working with Sphinx, I know the result's gonna look beautiful, and I, and I take that extra effort and care about my work, because it's gonna look great, and uh, can I get that link, and can I mark it up that way? So it's, this may just be me, and I'm weird, but, um, it is a sort of, thank you, uh, but I, I, I feel so much more sort of pride in my work because I know that, so for example, the LibJCC JIT documentation, because I, I, I got really into it because I knew it was going to look great using Sphinx, and mm -hmm. I was a kind of, I don't want to work on this if it's tech info, it's, I, don't, I just don't have the enthusiasm if it's going to be 1990 style web page with a navigation stretch I can't understand, and now I'm being rude about tech info and I should stop. <laughs> I mean, what do we need to do? Is there other action items? We've got 15 minutes, I think. Sorry, I'm taking yeah, the, control the, of your talk. Yeah, the, we, we, um, we, we can skip the conversion details, but yeah, the conclusion is, uh, do we want to use Sphinx? And is there anybody who can uh, somehow approve it? Because, I don't know, for instance, Richie is kind of okay-ish with, with the patch. Uh, 
And to be honest, I, I, I yeah, we had some private conversation with uh, documentation maintainers, Sandra and uh, Gerald. Yeah, and it's well, the problem is that it's it's a bike shedding issue. It's it's it's, it's, it's a typical topic for bike shedding. And for instance, I know Sandra has some comments about the visual nits and uh, it's. Um, it's yeah. I I I won't be able to fix all the small uh, fallback uh, fallback uh, fallout which which comes from the migration. Well, I mean, in terms of Sandra has years of deep knowledge and expertise about our documentation, and I mean, I guess the question is: is she is she is she is she here? Is she on board? Does anyone? I mean, I suspect. Do we need to convince her? Who who do we need to? He, she she she's she sufficiently happy. Yeah, she, 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 yeah she, she told me that she can write technical documentation in, in any format, so she, 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 she's, she's fine with, with, yeah. uh, with the format selection. Yeah. But she had some smaller comments about the, about the migrated version of documentation. Uh, in terms of the other, I guess, requirements, um, one of the, for me, I want good, a good in, a kind of in order of preference, I want great HTML, I want good PDF, and I want good man page. Well, I, I think both the man page and the PDF are the same. You didn't show the generated man page, but I mean, I know it looks great, but maybe you want to... Uh, I guess the question is, do we have a consensus? How do we make a decision on, can we do this? Because um, for me, I'd love, I've, I've been wanting to do this for years, but I don't know if... I'm like Dave, I, I use Sphinx, I'd prefer to use Sphinx rather than tech info. But I think the people to convince are those who don't yet use Sphinx. And that's why the comment I made earlier, I think is really important, is to make it easy because the oh no, yet another technology is changing, I've got to learn, learn yet another thing is a real barrier. And you know, people may quibble about the layout, but that's the one that really matters. Yeah. And so if, I, I think if we could, I'd love to have it to happen straight away because it would make everything easier. But I think, to, you, to bring people along, you've got to give them that helping hand. Yeah, and, and, step. and if we can do that, then I think it... So, so I can definitely there. extend the in, internal documentation chapter. I can link some, some yeah, the most common, most common keywords. And I can also help people struggling with documentation. It's, yeah, for me, it's very similar to migration from SVN to, to JIT. So, so we also made a migration. And then there was, I don't know, Jonathan, for instance, helping others get used to the basics for those who, who are not familiar with, with, the, with, the, with the change. So, yeah, I'm... Um, I've had limited exposure to Sphinx, and uh, you mentioned in one of your slides, Git blame will become more hard. And is that for the RST files? That it, what does that mean exactly? It, it means that, that we have a history which is, which is uh, in, the, in the tech info source files. And there's entire history there. So if you want to investigate a change, you will have to go back to revision before the migration, and then you will be able to blame. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, how often do how how often um, do you do it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think I'm a little bit worried the dependent for you, not for developers, of course, we install things. And so do we, for instance, print the documentation in GCC re underscore release for the users so they don't have these dependencies? Or well, the, if, if you want to, if you want, even now, if you want to build a GCC, if you don't have tech info, you will not get built manual pages and info pages. So it's even now it's optional dependency. So we will, you'll still be able to build compiler. And about the, the dependency, if, if you if you don't have um, a package provided by your distribution, you can use uh, pip, which is a lightweight yeah, uh, yeah it's it's a Python packaging system which you can get uh, the package just for you as a user. Not system wise, so it's. Yeah, for kernel folks, I mean, kernel developers are not pleased with new dependencies. We were able to get past this. We added a little script that looks at your system and sees, you know, depending on just your distribution, what packages you should install to actually run it. And you can certainly steal ours if you want to do that. 
But I would also say that relative to something like tech info, unless you're generating PDF, right, if you're just generating HTML, which most of our users are doing, um, the dependency chain is a whole lot simpler because you can drop the whole tech mess. Yeah, exactly. And that makes life so much yeah. nicer. So, so, yeah. So I guess an implied question there is, do we include some of these generated manuals in the release tables, like I think we do with the info manuals generated by tech info at present? Can, can you actually generate info from... Yeah, yes, that's, that, that's what we do for lab GCC JIT or for ADA manuals. But the presume there's no reason that you can't generate them and then include them in the tarball anyway. And I would note, if you're building a whole tool chain, you've probably got Python as a dependency anyway for GDB. Yeah. In, in the case of OpenSUSE, it's, it's a problem that we have, yeah, so-called ring zero, which is a selection of packages where each depends on each other, basically. So you want to keep it as small as possible because these, I don't know, for GCC, GDB, binutils, there are very many transitive dependencies if you, you have very many cycles from dependency point of view. Okay, so, 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 so the question is still open. Uh, how should I get proper approval uh, from who makes the decision? Yeah, who's the decision maker? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to say, do we, a straw, is it fair or okay to take a straw poll of the room and like see how people feel about conversion, uh, migrating to tech info, or is that do people feel uncomfortable being put on the spot? Like who? Who Sorry? likes the idea of the migration? <laughs> and who doesn't like the idea at the moment? Or maybe you don't want to be put on the spot. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, it seems that I think we have, at least in this room, everyone wants to do this. Um, but maybe this is a self-selecting <clears throat> group because we are the people who came to the, this particular boff. Well, yeah, but, but decisions are always taken by people who care the most. The, the, the only thing, so I sort of think that there is very little opposition and that, uh, you know, we should probably raise this at the uh, session with everybody, with, 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 with a steering committee session, uh, that basically everybody in the buff was happy about it. I was just only a little bit worried about the documentation maintainers. I mean, they should really be on board. So I mean, if, 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 if it is like small things that can be changed afterwards, then I would say let's, you know, do it gradually one after another. And if it, you know, the, mm -hmm. it is impossible to, to just do, to change everything at once. It's just my only worry is that if it was actually the, the, the changes requested by Sandra, if they are like easy to do afterwards, yes. or is it something that really needs to be done now? Otherwise something is lost and... No, it's it, it can be done afterwards because, yeah, she, she has questions about or comments about selection of colors of individual, for instance, hyperlinks in PDF. She actually... Okay, so, so it's not really anything like no objections? No, that no, no. It's, so, it's, so, so they, the maintainers are also basically okay with yes. it? Yes. They, they are busy. Apparently, they don't, they don't have much time for, for documentation, uh, but they are... Yeah, I know about two of them, about uh, Gerald Pfeiffer and uh, Sandra Lusmore. So, I, and, and and Joseph, you, you can you can express. As far as I'm concerned, once Sand was happy that it's ready to go, I'm happy that it's ready to go. <clears throat> I wonder how important Git blame is for documentation. How many times do people? How many times has anybody here used git blame in, on the documentation? Yeah, you have a, an excuse. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, sometimes we'd like to see yeah, a change in documentation. Uh, 
for the changes now or, or, or later incrementally, I think it's, it's important uh, how much changes it would be. It's fine to change a few lines here or, or there, but we need to change basically every line in every file or, or even worse, rename most of the files, uh, then, then it could be a problem. Uh, I wanted just uh, to, to ask about the generated formats it can support, so, so it supports HT, normal HTML, PDF? Manual pages and info as well. Info, nice. Uh, in, so, so it doesn't support those huge single page HTMLs we had? Yeah, it, it can contain, it can support also this, this HTML if you want it, but okay. uh, we don't probably want it or... <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, is the idea to just convert the master branch or also the release branches? So um, I, I'm planning to changing it only for master branch. I, I was just thinking about the issue of uh, cherry picking or backporting changes from master branch to release branches, which will then need manual changes. Yeah, the, the, the question is how often do you do backport or documentation changes, which mainly come from newly added features which you don't backport. I was wondering if it will be just some conversion or it will be a bigger, I'm, ex I'm expecting it to be a bigger piece of work because as you go into the tech files you'll for sure figure out, you'll for sure see stubs which you think are obsolete, like some statements. Most of the documentation seems good but then what are your thoughts on that? Would, do you expect yourself to get into, because that exercise can then become bigger, right? If you, if you end up seeing some stubs in the tech files which are obsolete, and then how do we deal with that? Do we go to the maintainers to ask for their specific portions from the documentations to be converted, or? I, I just, I, I'm just trying to convert it one to one, and if you want to make changes to documentation, you can, you can modify the, the current the current tech info version, and I will migrate it at, at one at one point. Similarly, as we move from SVN to, to, to Git, so we, so there will be some point where we will migrate all one to one. So if you want to make changes, do it now. So that that was one of the arguments that yeah we should improve the content of the documentation. And I'm saying yeah you can do it even now. It's it, nothing is blocking improvements. Uh, yeah. And then so. Once this conver when this conversion is done, do you think there is any need to sort of validate whether everything did get? Yeah, I'm, 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 completely? I'm actually migrating the documentation every, I don't know, two weeks. And I, I send a patch to mailing list multiple times. Yeah. And the result is yeah, publicly available. Uh, so, so I guess yeah, this is, this is, Documentation which is I don't know, five five days old, so uh, I'm yeah. So so everybody who, who who was interested in the in the output quality could take a look because it, it's not the first time I'm uh, I made a migration. So uh, with the mic. What we do about the target of the dev, which contains snippets of yeah, I, I I also migrated the content of the of the definitions, and I rewrote the the script which uh, emits the how we call it, it's it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a file which we somehow include. Am I correct? So well, so it, it generates a new file and com you need to compare manually. Yes. Yeah, so in case of Sphinx. You, you define so-called snippets, and then you can you, you can directly uh, include uh, these individual snip, snippets of documentation, and uh, it's 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 working. The the, the patch set I sent okay, uh, nice. includes these changes, which which are fine, and we will st we and we will still have the 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 need for copying uh, the how is it called tm dot txi, which you have to copy because of the licensing um, issues, so it will remain that you will also copy this file which is created automatically from a dev files. 
So, so in terms of what this would look like, in, oh, we're kind of out, running out of time. Uh, sorry, the, the, it would be like one enormous Git commit that basically deletes all of the .tech info files within GCC slash doc and replaces them with a bunch of .rst files. Yeah, the, the, the patch set contains, I don't know, five, six patches. So one is the removal, as you mentioned. The second is like copying the, the new content, which is automatically generated. Mm -hmm. There's some integration into the build system, and there are some there are some uh, uh, yeah small tweaks to to the, to the automatically converted stuff. Plus, the question is, for instance, uh, yeah, you, you would probably agree uh, migrating uh, because I have I have a shared config, config file which I use for all the all the all the manuals. So I will migrate libgcc uh, JIT to using the, the shared configuration. And the question is for, for ADA manuals if they, if they are fine with uh, doing the same. So, 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 so there's some shared configuration which, which takes uh, version and uh, it's, it's, it's doing a settings for the, for the Sphinx, so an, yeah, an individual configuration. I guess, well, we're running out of time. We, we, yeah, we are over, over time. I had a question for Jakob, actually, if I may, which is with your release manager hat on, um, does this plan seem reasonable? And when would we, if we were to do this, when mm -hmm. would be good? Good question. But that's putting you on the spot, and I'm sorry. That's for Joseph or Richie as well. Uh, I think it can happen any time. Because we are not changing I think the people documentation. aren't sitting on large documentation changes for, for features they are working. It's, it's much worse for, for code, actually. So, so when we switch the .c to .cc and, and stuff like that, uh, I think in, in this case, it can be done now. Yeah, I, I don't have any. any yeah, I, I would actually like to have enough time to fix all the fallout, which is going to happen. So, so, so for me, earlier is 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 better. Okay. Okay. So that's that's all, and uh, yeah, we will ask at the uh, steering committee on Sunday. Thank you.
this pointer or presenter, you, oh. can, you can use it. And that could actually help on a couple slides. Um, but uh, battery is running out, so oh, okay. <laughs> I cannot guarantee it will work in yeah, the whole presentation. It's, it's uh, okay. Yeah, great. And also for moving slides. It's, uh -huh. If I connect to your laptop. Mm. You can try.
I think I, I played with it. It doesn't work. Was it not muted? Oh, it was muted, right? Red, right. it's muted. Okay. Green is unmuted. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. So, let's get started, I guess. So, hello everyone, welcome to uh, the system's uh, both session. <laughs> we can actually discuss anything here, but to get started, uh, we prepared some slides, first of all, about our newly released machine. So, we normally release machines every two years, and the previous one was called Z15. And yeah, now unsurprisingly, it's Z16, the, uh, the machines. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, the machines are normally quite big, so you see we used to have 190 cores in the maximum configuration in the previous generation. Now it's upgraded to 200. The size of caches has also grown significantly, especially uh, L2 and L4. And we've switched to a different uh, technology from 14 to 7 nanometers. And uh, yeah, here you see the photo of the chip. Uh, on the next slide, we have uh, a description of uh, what is what. So, as you can see, we have eight cores on every processor chip. And uh, yeah, if you're wondering about the whole system topology on every drawer, drawer is like a motherboard. We have four of these, and then there are four drawers. So, in total, 256 cores if you multiply all the values. And uh, yeah. Uh, not all of them are available to end users, so it's just 200 that are available to the end users. Um, and uh, also there are a bunch of, okay, how do I point? Yeah, a bunch of accelerators. So this is AI unit, I'll be talking about it a bit later. And this is the deflate acceleration unit, so um, yeah, quite a few things right on the CPU chip uh, with uh, the Especially with the caches, it has been a very interesting update because before we had a really traditional structure where, where we had L1, L2, L3, L4, uh, like a hierarchy like everybody else. Uh, this time, physically, we have only L2s, but these L2s are, can be shared between different cores and between, and between different CP chips. And from that arises virtual L3 and L4 caches. Um, this is based on the observation that uh, machines might not be fully loaded all the time, and therefore cores can benefit from caches on other cores. And uh, indeed, uh, simulations show that uh, in real workloads, every core has about 50% more cache than before. Um, yeah. So another update is, of course, that we have new uh, machine instructions. One update has been to our vector decimal support. Uh, IBM Z has already a lot of instructions uh, regarding decimal, handling decimal point in hardware. Unfortunately, uh, that's not widely utilized in the open source projects. It's mostly for uh, proprietary code, so I'll just mention this and uh, go further. Um, so, this is probably the most exciting thing in, the, thing in this release. Uh, so, there is this new uh, chip that's located right on the CPU uh, that helps with machine learning. And um, this chip is driven by a new machine instruction called an NPA, Neural Network 
processing assist. Uh, since this uh, chip uses its own floating point format, so it's 16-bit uh, with, I think, 6-bit exponent, so completely non-standard, um, there are a few instructions that help you quickly convert between standard and this non-standard data format. And yeah, last but not least, uh, several uh, instructions that, her that help with kernel development, I think, to uh, to the tools community, th these two might be interesting because we have this uh, last break in event register, bear, and uh, it's visible actually in JDB. However, due to security reasons, we have to reset it on every context switch because otherwise uh, we will see kernel address in there from user space, which is not good. So sometimes in JDB you cannot uh, find or see what uh, the last jump was, and with the introduction of these two instructions, we can not simply reset it in the kernel, but rather load and store. So uh, with the new hardware, this support should be fixed and fully working. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, toolchain updates, uh, since there are not too many new hardware instructions, not uh, too much has changed. Uh, in particular, in GNU assembly, we of course support all the mnemonics. For the new instructions, we have introduced new M architecture, Z16. Uh, well, uh, as I said, it's called Z16, and it's no surprise, but for example, four generations ago, I think it was ZEC12, so not Z12. Uh, therefore, we normally cannot, uh, even if we know internally how the machine is going to be called, we cannot release this uh, to the public, therefore, we just do some counting, Arch 14, next is going to be Arch 15, etc. And then at later point in time, when the announcement comes, we introduce that. So, uh, yeah, a peculiarity of our platform. And then some of the instructions have been exposed as intrinsics. These are for AI, and those you have already seen. So, yeah, now coming to the uh, machine learning accelerator. So, there it is. Quite, yeah, quite big, maybe as large as one L2 cache. Um, so every AI, so AI accelerators you have on every chip. So one AI accelerator delivers about six, six teraflops. Uh, and then if you look at the full system, if uh, yeah, it has the maximum amount of CPUs, it's uh, about 200. Um, so what uh, does this give us? Because normally, you know, everybody does AI on video cards, for example. Uh, one of the biggest uh, advantages is better latency because it can just talk directly to the cache. Um, and yeah, that's, I would say, the main benefit. Of course, you may also wonder what if uh, we just did all the operations that are required for machine learning, like, for example, matrix multiplication using existing vector instructions. And uh, benchmark shows, benchmarks show that this is now much, much faster orders of magnitude. So this is uh, definitely worth it. And uh, does the vector unit of the main CPU support half float format? No, no. no. So, you, okay. well, I mean, you have now uh, the conversion instructions, but that's the only thing it, it can do with them. So, what number of bits in the DL float? Sorry? The number of bits of DL float format? 16. 16, mm -hmm. okay. So, for AI, you don't need too much precision, so that's why, yeah. But that does mean that uh, you can't load, or you shouldn't probably load uh, every CPU with an AI accelerator using application, right? Because there's only one and one per eight CPUs, right? Um, yeah, so if you want to have basically maximum performance, you can only run one yeah, so we, we, AI we actually, workload per chip, basically. We, we actually had these discussions in context of uh, other simulator, uh, sorry, accelerators like the compression accelerator, yeah. because that's exactly the same story. Yeah. And of course, ideally, applications should be like aware of that. Uh, yeah, we also toyed with ideas of some auto-tuning in kernel because we have hardware counters which say like how much these units are utilized, and then maybe the scheduler could know about this, but uh, yeah, this was too far-fetched, so we didn't uh, 
go forward with this. Yes, as far as I remember, Intel had some proposal, uh, some similar proposal for the kernel, but I'm not sure if uh, it went anywhere, like load aware scheduling or something, something along these lines. But okay. Um, so what uh, what exactly can it do? Can it do if we don't use buzzwords like AI or deep learning? So there are uh, a bunch of uh, it's simply a bunch of mathematical functions. Uh, in the simplest case, just element-wise addition, subtraction, etc. But then, of course, there are functions that are used for neural networks, uh, so activation functions, ReLU, um, yeah, etc. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm standing at the wrong place. Okay. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, now I see myself. <laughs> Very good. Um, for general neural network support, we have mat matrix multiplication and batch normalization. That's, I think, normally used, especially the last one, uh, during training. And uh, for convolutional neural networks, that's like, uh, as far as I know, for image recognition, uh, max pool, two-dimensional max pool, two-dimensional average pool, and, of course, convolutions themselves. And finally, for recursive neural networks, that's, as far as I know, for, used for working with text. We have LSTM and GRU functions, so that's uh, yeah, that's all there is. But I would say quite 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 a lot for today's state of the art machine learning. Uh, so we have all these instructions now in the CPU, but at the same time there is already uh, machine learning ecosystem out there, like various libraries already exist. So how to integrate all that so that you know we don't build our own stack from scratch? Um, so the lowest level component in our solution is called ZDNN. This is a wrapper around the NNPA instruction that you can use from C language uh, quite conveniently. Uh, so that's one piece. Another piece is called ONNX. This is not something IBM invented. This is Open Neural Network Exchange. This is a data format in which you export, among other things, your trained models. Uh, and the final component is called IBM ZDLC, uh, Deep Learning Compiler. So what it does, it takes a model in ONNX format and converts it into a shared object. And uh, this shared object, of course, contains calls to ZDNN and to uh, the NNPA function, uh, machine instruction. So yeah, that's uh, the vision of uh, how this, well, n not the vision, a lot of this is already implemented and can be used. So that's how these hardware features are integrated in uh, yeah, modern machine learning stacks. And I think that was all about the hardware update. Um, any questions? Uh, so is the AI, ex AI accelerator working on the normal register set or, or does it contain its own registers uh, or whatever oh, else in storage? Uh, because I'm, I'm wondering about the kernel context switch, if it needs to be saved or not, and if it needs to be part of make context. So there is no kernel context switch when starting an NNPA instruction. There is a uh, the information is just passed to a different unit on the same chip, right? The, that, that unit then just get, gets kicked off and gets started doing its thing. So basically it's chastering stuff the main CPU? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, internally it has its own state, of course, yeah. but, but that state is then just... Similar, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just hidden behind a single instruction. So. It, right. The, the, so there is no context switch. That's the, that's the difference, maybe, to a graphics card, right? When you when you actually execute this assist instruction, is that synchronous? 
So like the execution will only continue when the accelerator finished? Yes, okay. exactly. I think there can be, if an interrupt arrives in the middle, then the instruction will stop, but it will say, please restart me, as far as I know. But again, it will store its state in memory, so you don't need to maintain anything in the kernel. So there, there can be a partial completion state, and then you can just restart the instruction. It's exactly the same, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andres, can you pass the microphone? <laughs> Regarding the floating format, uh, does it have infinities, nuns, sun zeros, and stuff like oh, that? Oh, good question. It's uh, spe uh, uh, so I cannot answer right now, but it's special in this regard. As far as I know, there are no sign zeros, for example, but uh, other details I don't remember. But yeah. <laughs> and uh, is the plan to uh, offer the floating point type for users? No, it's source, just for the... Just, just the intrinsics? Yes. Okay. Right, the floating point type is not externalized, really. It's, it's internal. Yeah, I mean, and I think format is documented, but... Uh, it's, yeah, the, the idea is, I think, that it can also be changed in the future. But. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the deal with all the accelerators. If you look at our architecture document, they are documented not under simple instructions, but in their own chapter with a big disclaimer on top that, like, please use libraries. This is subject to change. But <laughs> it will inevitably lead to some people thinking, uh, all this back and forth conversion is really, really slow, so I'm writing my software library towards that floating point format to use the accelerator without any conversions needed. So, so you probably can't change the format anyway in the future <laughs> anymore. So <laughs> you don't have to expose it as a special type, of course, in, in the C language, but uh, you probably can't change it anymore. Okay, so. If there are no more questions about hardware, ah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so since we do have compiler people in this room, did, did you think how can this AI accelerator be used from the compiler? So what's, what, uh, what, what has it kind of features that would match a use case inside the compiler? Well, I mean, if we now go into area of, let's say, wild dreams, um, it might be that if a compiler recognizes one of these patterns, it could, in theory, insert this instruction. <laughs> um, so it, it may be similar to vectorization in some areas, but yeah, of course, the data type severely limits the applicability, right? <laughs> yeah. I, one can probably exactly represent 8-bit uh, integers. 8-bit uh, so integers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I think Mantisa is 9, right? So it's 9 plus 6 plus sine bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, vectorization of. So, you know, I haven't been paying much attention to this other than I know it exists and we've been looking at the ZDNN low-level library. Um, the thing that, that I'm trying to think of right now is um, Michael mentioned make context. So if the, if the accelerator is just this black box, then we're not saving anything in make context, right? There's no additional register file that needs to be saved. Do you define, there's no procedure call standard changes at all, right? Because there's, there's, you can't call a function that would have any of these things as arguments, I assume, right? There's no PCS change. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, the dynamic loader has uh, auditing functions that let you actually change registers on the fly as you call other functions. But I don't know if 
we ever want to expose any of these registers in there? Probably not. So I guess it's just is an opaque box, right? Like it's you just prep your data, you call the function, it tries to complete the operation, and it returns back to you the results, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Actually, now that we are talking about it, so what, what, what's, the, what's the instruction, actually, this, this thingy assist? Uh, what, what, what's what's yeah. the operance of that instruction? A memory blob or a... Memory blob, no. Ah, yeah. okay, so it's... It's not even registers or something. No, right? there's a memory well, block I mean, that, that uh, contains. The address of memory block is in the register. Yeah, of but course, uh, it, it, yes, of <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a single register which specifies everything via this memory block. Mm. Uh, I think it's okay. even implicit. Like it's always it's always register one or something, as far as I remember. But yeah, okay, that's tiny details. Okay, okay, okay. I see. Yeah, that was, so then there's nothing yeah. really to do. Yeah, okay, so with all these accelerators, we actually ran into some problems with the tooling. And uh, yeah, Andreas can talk about this. Yeah, okay, so this is just um, because I, I stumbled in, on this uh, in the context of Valkyrie. So Valkyrie is not a GNU tool per se, but I'm still talking about it now. <laughs> Bear with me. So the problem here is, in general, we, we, have, we have already seen that we not only have this NNPA instruction, but also um, there's already this uh, compression instruction. And in general, how do we support such instructions in tools like Valgrind? The, the problem statement is maybe a little bit wider, and it would also apply to other tools, but, but I'm focusing on Valkyrie now. So, so these, um, these instructions, they are implemented in an on-chip coprocessor, as we have seen, right? Uh, they, their behavior is often controlled through a control block, like we discussed before, right? It, you pass the arguments in a memory block. Um, they often operate on large amounts of memory, so the idea is that you can do a mat matrix multiplication with thousands of elements with one instruction, right? Then the instruction comes back and the result's already there. Um, and they are way faster than uh, the software approach would be, so yeah, um, emulating the, the instructions would be even slower than the software approach, and it would result in a slowdown of a factor of, I don't know, 1,000 or something. Um, okay. Question? Uh, we only have one microphone, so. <laughs> one question is, is, is the accelerator specified to the very detail or only on the functional level? So can you even emulate something on the instruction level because it's probably not specified on the instruction level? It's really just specified on the functional level, at least in the architecture. So emulating it is difficult anyhow, right? Yeah, that's true. So, okay. Um, so these are problems. Um, other instructions that we also have, which, are, which seem complicated but are way easier, of course, um, is one of, the, one of them is the vector string search instruction. It's, a, it's an instruction that searches um, a string and another string, but the strings are restricted to vector sizes. So the vector is, in, in, in this case, um, a maximum of six, the vector is 16 bytes long, so the string is also 16 bytes long at max. At max. Um, and in that case, we can actually do emulation. It's, it's acceptable, the slowdown is very high, but the instruction doesn't occur that frequently, so it's, it's usually acceptable. Um, so basically, the whole loop of what is needed here is unrolled, and, uh, and then the whole thing is emulated. Um, or in the case of move, the, the move instruction, move character instruction, the cop which copies up to um, 256 bytes of memory, um, that instruction 
is, is also emulated by a loop branching to the instruction itself and decrementing a counter. And just one byte is copied in each iteration. So that's also acceptable. Um, yeah. Uh, in the case of NNPA, these both approaches don't work. What, what's another solution in Valgrind is what people have done for other instructions is to implement a dirty helper. Uh, that dirty helper would then basically invoke the instruction by itself and then also provide some wrapper, wrapper logic around that. Um, yes, so this is possible also with the NNPA, of course. It, it can be invoked this way. But then the problem is that um, uh, the memory operations are not instrumented. So Valgrind doesn't see that you read or write any memory and which memory effects you generate with this. So the only thing that a dirty helper can do is read or write a very small memory region. Not both, and the memory regions can also not be large. So this is a restriction at the moment. Um, so dirty helpers are not really a solution, I would say. Then there is a te the te tedious solution to forward the NPA, NNPA with a dirty helper, as discussed before, uh, with a dirty helper. And then rely on the application programmer to <laughs> add information about the memory effects. Uh, as this is basically done with ASAN, right? Um, and then there, there's a solution that I'm working on right now, which basically treats this similar to a system call. Um, so system calls are already capable of dealing with large memory regions. They are also tracking the memory effects correctly. So that's basically what I'm looking for to, to do it in this way. So yeah, that's, I think that's it. Any questions? Um, so the problems you have with the dirty helpers seems to be really limited to wall grind limitations, basically. Because for instance, in QEMU, it's, it's done the similar way, just without the restrictions. You can, if, if you have complicated instructions that you need to emulate, do you write your helper that implements the functionality of the instructions, including announcing memory effects? So you would write your checking routines there and or checking predicates there, and then it returns. And then and what the emulator does is then inserting a call to that helper routine, right? So. Uh, without any strange restrictions. So, and your idea of doing it with a system, like system call handling is basically the same, right? You insert a call, random routine is called at emulation side and, well, needs to do whatever it needs to do. So that seems to be the, 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 the sensible solution. And I think th there is no reason I can see, at least for Valgrind, to have the restrictions while the dirty helpers can't be extended to also provide large regions, input and output, and so on. So that seems just specific to wall grind, which should be, I think, fixable. Yeah, and so for, and for, for QEMO, so with, the, with like things with the vector uh, string search, so the, the idea is probably if you, if you like uh, implement them with the, the QEMO IR that, that you get the, the code jitted in, in the end, of course, if you do the do magic, do magic, then at least you will have a jump from the jitted code into different code or prevent jitting. I'm not sure what QM actually does in that case. Yeah. Um, Mark Villard is here. Have you asked him what his opinion is? So. Mark is here. He's a Valgrind developer. Have, OK. Perfect. Does he have an opinion? No. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, I haven't 
show them this here. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm saying you should corner Mark, show him the slides, and ask him his opinion. <laughs> I talked to him before his vacation, I think, and um, at that time I didn't have this proposal yet, so he hasn't seen this yet. So <laughs> I will probably have a chance later. Okay, um, yeah, interesting about QMU. Um, one difference between QMU and Valgrind may, may be that Valgrind is also instrumenting the instructions, not just emulating them. Of course. So maybe, maybe that's one reason why this design looks different. Mm. Presumably, but, but everything that I mean, there are only limited effect an instruction can have, right? Uh, that that need to be emulated by Valgrind, which is how the, the accesses to memory, maybe some traps, arithmetic or otherwise, and so on. But yeah, all of these needs to be need to be correctly emulated to be of use for Valgrind. But well, that's what needs to be done then, right? And QEMO needs to do the same. I mean, if there is a trap while loading the memory region that it needs to load, then the QEMO routine also needs to trigger the trap to be, of co to be a correct simulation, right? And yes, Valgrind does a bit more, but on a per instruction level, it's not that much more that, that it correctly needs to represent, right? There are, there are very local effects that an instruction can have, and yeah, so they, they should be innumerable. <laughs> so uh, you probably do already emulate the, the compression um, of loading, no? In, 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 in QEMO? No? I mean, um, because of uh, the restrictions of Valgren at the moment, um, we have not emulated any of the complex instructions yet. So neither the compression nor the encryption facilities, right? Nothing like that yet. Because what, what we've seen is that the, the compression offloading can be at least lead to surprising results. Only to you. It's surprising to me. So they, 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 they can result in valid compressed data, but um, non-obvious in, in some way. So, and, 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 uh, so the question is, if it's enough specified uh, to emulate the behavior, and if the behavior is even the same between the different Z implementations probably no, not. No, I think it's, it, it, it varies not even between, not only between chip releases, but really if you call this instruction two times, you will get different deflate streams. They will all decompress, but they will be different, so it's not so deterministic. How, how, how can you reasonably emulate that kind of system? Well, I mean, you don't emulate you just, you just one to one, Z, right? You just call Zlib yeah, system? That, yeah, that's what... <laughs> I would do, yeah. <laughs> any other questions? Or any other questions to these systems? <laughs> um, <laughs> can I have one? Uh, no. Um, uh, so the, the question is, how how do you see the the, the vector support evolving? Uh, I mean, we, we can see that even PowerPC, which I assume is kind of a baby step ahead, maybe of the Z ISA in in that regard, uh, is lacking compared to like x86 or ARM in in features like masking, predication, and whatever. Is that going to change, or is that not really focus of the two architectures? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really cannot tell you. I, I, I really don't know. So you probably should have to ask somebody else about this. Yeah, I mean, we have these proposals to the hardware team that we submit each time, yeah. and I think some of them was, some of that was included, but yeah, not, it's not in Z16 yet. 
I mean, we have features that other platforms do not have. I think the vector string features are not, are not very typical, at least. Um, so, but other than that, I, I really don't know what the future brings. I mean, we also have the vector decimal stuff that, yeah, but, that Ilya mm -hmm. just skipped, but <laughs> it's, it's actually interesting, maybe, but uh, nobody uses it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, one of the use cases is converting decimals to strings yeah. really quickly, but unfortunately, it's to it's it's to it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we maybe we could speed up something like S print with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Significantly. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Would be, would be so yeah, so so there are features that others don't have. There are certainly features that others have that we don't have, and I, I really don't know what the plan is to to bring them or not. We we also have some restrictions on the instruction formats. I think that limit us a, a little bit. But other than that, I don't know exactly what the plan is. But so far, uh, vectors have already provided a significant speed up, of course, in the, since we have them. Yeah, they, they were pretty useful already. Any other questions about these systems? Yeah, I think the, the reason why Richard is asking is because especially masked uh, instructions provide some very good means to, for compilers to use them and make more loops vectorizable in size constraints uh, applications, well, well, just functions. Uh, so so, so it, it would be helpful for more architectures to have them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you, you probably know that we have very limited masking features. <laughs> we, can, we have vector load with length, and we have uh, the capability of using just the first element of a vector, a floating point vector, <laughs> something like that. But yeah, okay, so that's. I shouldn't have mentioned that, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but it's an interesting point about uh, instruction um, format. So okay, we need four arguments, right, for masking instructions. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's definitely not going to fit easily. Of course, we could start using register pairs or something for that, but yeah, that can complicate things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we should <laughs> note that masking is important. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. At that time, I th who was there? Andreas was there, I guess. Andreas Krebel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, another question here. So for the accelerator instructions, did you define some kind of intrinsics API to use it? With maybe, I don't know, a pointer to memory that it does its accelerating into? Oh, no, not really. We didn't do anything in the compiler, of course, in libraries that implement them, so not implement, but wrap them, like zlib and uh, zdnn. We have that, but it's like, yeah, internal. Right. But, yeah, you can always copy-paste it from there into your own code. <laughs> cool. And I was just that for various of these, I don't know, matrix or operations recently, I know that Clang has added some kind of matrix data type extension which is sort, of, sort of like a vector extension, but it's two-dimensional, and they overload like the plus, minus, and multiplication operators for them. So I was kind of wondering over the last ah, year whether you see such, one to such high level wrappers. Point. It's not really related to, your, to any architecture particularly. It's a higher level abstraction. Mm -hmm. The middle end couldn't decompose it to 
whatever I say it would want? Oh, that's a good question. But yeah, right now I can't answer if anything like this exists. But it could be part of the DNN, but no, no promises. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, David. So, so I don't know if I, I missed it, but any information about the cryptography facility, especially the post-quantum cryptography support? Um, oh, I haven't included it into slides, but okay. yeah, in, uh, in Z16 there is this new Crypto Express 8, I think, card that provides two quantum safe algorithms, I think, for key exchange and, and uh, key establishment and digital signatures. Yeah, so it's, it's there. <laughs> it's not on the CPU guide. No, that, that, that one is separate. Anything else? One, two, three. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mm, okay. Okay. Some spare time. Yeah.
Just Mention random it. things until it works. <laughs> It's, it's Linux, and it's, um, I've got a laptop with a 4K display. Who wants a 15-inch laptop with a 4K display? Um, go figure. Right, OK. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my turn to do the boff this year. Um, I've got with me uh, Kirill, Wilco, Jabox, and Alex, who are all members of the ARM GNU tour teams. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions that you've got. So, it's your boff. What are the questions? <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Could be a very short boff. <laughs> Somebody's Wandered off with it. Yeah. Um, Zabolsh, I sent you an email just recently um, because I've started going back through the entire old backlog of glibc patches uh, as a way to kind of trigger some patch review. But I came across the one bug that I think we still have open, which I think impacts AR64 as an architecture more often than not. It's a generic issue, and it's in the um, Atomics used for DL open, where you can get into a scenario where DL open always is slow. And it was like patch 14 out of a 14 series patch set, and I think at Hammerville Act 13 of them, except for the last one. So the last one's still outstanding. Um, do we, th and I think, and that one might have even been an RFC, do we think we want to repost that and then just ha try to review it? because I still think that there is probably a performance impact there with the atomics in those areas. And I know Wilco's been cleaning up the atomics, and thank you for that, Wilco. So the reason why I was not too keen on pushing that one patch is because that patch series fixed a number of um, kind of uh, concurrency logic <coughs> in, in the dynamic linker. And I end up having like a relatively simple model of concurrency, like there is a lock now, and lock, we take the lock when we have to take the lock, and so on. Everything is protected. And the last patch essentially messes up that model. Like uh, it, 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 to, to do the performancing, you have to uh, have to use atomics kind of things. And uh, so I was less sure about that patch uh, to be correct. And uh, I remember there were multiple ways to do to that thing, um, but none of them uh, seemed perfect. Um, so it's, it's about uh, thread local storage access, uh, in presence of, like, this, yeah, this, something with DL open. Yep. Um, so w the the way I remember it is is there is a things of there are, there are a bunch of things that we have to go through, uh, and we fall into a slow pass, and and then we keep falling into a slow pass if after a deal open, and we just stuck there. And to fix that, you could uh, fix it a number of ways, but it's, I remember it was a bit technical, why, why the reasoning why, why it's not an obvious fix. And uh, I agree that it would be good to have because it is a real slowdown and uh, I just don't have a, so I have a way to f have a patch, but I'm not, I have to go back to, again, prove that this is the right thing to do. I, I just want to say Florian had his hand up, so Florian, can you unmute and hopefully you can speak and we can hear you. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. It should have been set up so that the laptop 
the system doing the data can play out? I have no idea, and the technical guru has wandered off. Okay. <laughs> Just to double check, are you, yeah, you still have your hand up, Florian. Are you speaking? You are unmuted. I guess maybe I can unmute my laptop and make you come through my laptop. So. Can you hold that mic to the laptop speaker? And... Yeah. All right, Florian, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Just yes. about. No. Oh. I will. He says he'll type it in the chat. Okay. He's a fast typer. Yeah, he says, please move on for now. Okay. No. Well, I could end the slide there. <laughs> But more realistically, what have we got next? Libenvec for AI64. Kirill, do you want to start about that? I can probably talk a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, part of the project. want to come between the green lines? Yeah, so um, one of the projects uh, I, I lead, uh, well, it, it's performance optimizations and tools just in general, one of the requests. We, keep getting more and more of this to get Libenvec already on AR64. It's something that exists in other architectures and we have users who would like to see that. Um, there are obviously various libraries like Sleeve and others that are uh, useful, but for general Linux adoption, if, it's, if we, people could use it from a normal platform toolchain like GNU, it will be very convenient. Uh, it's something we various people have worked on um, over the years, uh, both from ARM and from uh, uh, the OX system. Uh, so quite a lot of components are there. Um, so you know, the, we, we've defined a vector uh, PCS for passing the registers uh, the right way. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, routines in our ARM Optimized Routines project, which implement uh, some vector math, math stuff. Uh, there's a, anyway. Um, so we are looking to get all that uh, done some point in the future. Uh, we obviously need GLIPC and GC to agree on how to represent, how to expose these vector math routines. Um, uh, one request we did get recently was uh, whether we could get uh, Libenvec and GLIPC to get some math routines, uh, some vector math routines in there and expose them to the user uh, before the GC supports lands for auto-vectorizing them. Uh, the idea being that uh, there are certain runtimes like we, Python and NumPy in particular were told that would like to generate the mangled vector symbols directly because they know what they're doing and they would like to be able to call them there. Uh, whereas I believe the GLIPC design such as it is now rather prefers to wait until GC can actually you know, generate those uh, uh, vector calls itself before it actually accepts subroutines. So I can take this opportunity to gauge interest in the community if you'll be willing to accept uh, you know, some vector math routines with the exposed symbols for uh, non-GC compiled programs to link against. Uh, I suspect asking Joseph or someone else that question. What do you think? Would we? I sort of think this seems like a question for the GLibc buff, but I also have something I'm wondering about the live and vet question that might again be more suitable for the GLibc buff which is how much all of these things need to be an architecture-specific assembly versus how much we can do things in C code, maybe with some architecture-specific configuration rather than requiring so much architecture-specific assembly. Well, I endorse not using assembly whenever we can not uh, use assembly. Yeah, so I mean, our approach for writing these routines in, in the, our various internal libraries and all that is uh, with intrinsics. So they're not you know, architecture independent. And especially when you want to write the vector version of them, you kind of need to use the vector capabilities which, uh, for, on which we've relied on intrinsics, especially with things like SVE, which you, know, you want to use the predicate registers and all the other uh, stuff there. Um, so it's not assembly exactly, <laughs> but it's not exactly target independent either. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Joe. So we can take it to the GLibC buff, but we can talk about some of the AR64 specific aspects. But like, the more assembly we delete, the better. 
right? Like, and I think at Hemerval also has like, um, there's the outstanding like fast string all in C implementations that still are faster than even some of the purported architecture specific implementations. So um, I'm with Joseph, I think there's some of the stuff we can write and then we can do a, either a core kernel like a, of, of the implementation that's required to be in hardware. It's, it's still just hard to do, right? Because this is basically trying to refactor what we can out of all the architecture implementations, delete as much assembly as we can, and then, then work forwards. It's basically, it's a function of refactoring in many ways, the interfaces we have. Um, I will note Florian has a question. He had his hand raised, and I, ha I do have his question in writing. If we want to, if we want, I'm just saying there's a, another GLibc question, but um, uh, do we have any more questions about libemvec? So we finish the libemvec question out, then I'll, I can ask, Florian can raise his no, question. No, not that one. Yeah. This one. Does anyone else have a libemvec questions? I have a brief observation. You are growing HPC people on Darwin now. Um, you know, there are people doing weather modeling and stuff using the M1 chip, and it's giving pretty good answers, actually, pretty good performance, but it would be good to see, uh, not to see that kind of swept away by it's only going to work on Linux. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not, actually not familiar very well with uh, what the Darwin math library story is or how does one contribute to it or whether it is even it is open to contributions. But uh, it's pretty new. Uh, there's always the ARM optimized routines as a route to, fu to publishing um, fairly general, uh, open um, ARM optimized versions of, of these codes. It tends to be written in assembler, a lot of it, rather, rather than in C, but in a few cases we may be able to push C-based algorithms. The, re the real problem for the vector code is actually expressing it efficiently in well, in generic C, it's probably nearly impossible because you just don't, can't describe the width. Um, and expecting the vectorizer to vectorize that sort of code is probably pushing it a bit. Um, but on the other hand, we could use intrinsics, and then you get the benefit of the compiler doing all the hard register allocation and scheduling, which is the other bit that, in general, it's very hard to write properly. and get the right expression of the, of the algorithm whilst also dealing with all the scheduling issues. But that community is also happy to use vectorization Well, the, the ARM optimized routines is, is um, fairly general. I mean, ARM, ARM controls it uh, because it's, it's ARM focused, but we'd probably act, I think the, is it a fairly standard community in bind equals outbound license? Um, I don't remember well, because you know. It's, it's multiple so. Yeah, it's, it's complicated because we need to be able to um, pass the implementations on to multiple C libraries with multiple different constraints. So actually, thinking about it, there's probably a copyright assignment because otherwise ARM can't do the, the relevant on, on, on licensing. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. There's an income sense how, how people can contribute to the thing and there's an outgoing license how mm -hmm. people can use our code and the outgoing license how people can use this code is very permissive it has MIT license and it's also available under the LLVM license so LLVM Lipsy can use it and we can contribute it under whatever license for the ARM people so yeah, yeah if that's not enough Any more on LibMVEC? Do we want to go to Florian's question? Sure. Um, Florian's question is stepping back to the earlier slight GLibc discussion, which is um, we're going to remove uh, legacy hardware cap support that drives uh, multi-lib path directory searching in favor of glibc hardware caps, right? So that raises a question, which Florian is raising, um, that there used to be an atomics multi-lib directory for ARM, and is it still needed, 
or have outline atomics really become the path forward? So as far as I'm aware, nobody's using it. So I one time tested it that it does what I think it does, should do. And I, unfortunately, it's now a part of AR64, glipsy. I think we can deprecate and nobody would notice, but I can't be sure, because it's the usual thing is. Anyway, the history there is that people asked for like being able to not just use the base atomics but use the new atomics, and that this was the first solution that we proposed, and that they, they and then people said they are not happy with this, and that the second solution was the outline atomics, which is much easier to deploy in distros for reasons, and uh, and yeah, that's what we have now. Um, so I guess uh, we can deprecate atomics uh, based the atomic directory lookup thingy. Next. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out, uh, no, this is more of a related question for Jakob, but uh, I'll, I'll ask him on that as, uh, uh, when I see him. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, there's also, GLIPC aside, there's also the question of how do we um, um, you know, expose the availability of these uh, uh, math routines to the GC auto vectorizer so it knows you know, which ones to use. Um, so we, there's been, <laughs> that, that's the thing that took us quite a long time to sort of sort out. Uh, and I think the solution where we expect to go with so far is to use the piggyback on this OpenMP declare variant uh, directive um, that should have enough expressibility to allow us to say that this uh, function has a vector variant and then that there says there's a neon variant, there's SVE variant and um, it, it all just about works together. Uh, we just need to hook it up in the implementation uh, so we have a Engineer Andre Vieira, uh, my team that uh, works on that. Um, so yeah, uh, once we kind of get a bit of agreement uh, with well, Jakob, um, that that's a okay thing to do. We'll probably go ahead and do that. Um, so once that is done and we get uh, you know some Jalipsy routines in for Libenvec, uh, we should be able to get an initial um, work and implementation for auto-vectorizing math routines with uh, GC and GLIPC. Uh, there's also other stuff that we can talk offline about, uh, more hairy things like how do you deal with sync calls and all these other custom APIs, how do you make it more efficient, whether you want other variants for unrolling and whether there's other SIMD ISAs that you might want to consider, fixed length uh, SVE and whatnot. Uh, those are all very deep topics. Uh, that we can sort out once we got the initial design uh, in a good shape. Uh, yeah, that's it on the bend back. Okay. Yeah, so the other thing in terms of making use of the ARM architecture we've got uh, is we're trying to look at functional multiversioning. Uh, also that's not new to GCC. Uh, XD6 at least has it. I think PowerPC has it too. Um, anyway, uh, the idea is you tag uh, your functions with an attribute saying I want multiple clones of this function for different ISAs, and then the compiler would generate the runtime um, checks for those ISAs, uh, for that ISA feature, and then do a dispatch. Um, we've had, had the request from multiple uh, parts of the ecosystem. Um, so we do have, uh, we have sort of designed the spec for you know, what exactly the standard, what, what the attributes will be, what the uh, ISA features, uh, how they all kind of tie together. Um, that's all defined in the ARMC language uh, extensions uh, document, the ACLE, which is, uh, uh, oh yeah, it is. There is a link to that. Yeah, it is, it is now public on GitHub. So, um, so you know, we, we already got some feedback on this uh, from Martin uh, earlier this year. So we are also already working on the Clang plus LVM implementation. We have a patch in review now, and we will be working on the GCC implementation uh, 
for uh, the GC14 timeframe, roughly. Um, so yeah, I, ex we'll be, I expect we'll be able to reuse a lot of the infrastructure in GC because uh, all of that target, node, saving and restoring, uh, that's all quite fiddly, but hopefully we shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel for a lot of it. That's it on that one. Any questions? If you follow the list, you know that we added a whole bunch of CPUs. Um, it's probably not very exciting to talk about technically. Uh, ARM releases architecture and CPUs all the it time. It would have been a long slide with no information yeah, yeah, of any yeah, use. So yeah. I did consider writing it, but it would have been a joke. for the marketing pitch for <laughs> all of our exciting IP. I'm going to read it off here because I'm getting a quick neck. Um, so this is a slide from Louis, who unfortunately can't make it this weekend. Um, some of the work that's been done in GDB, um, well, you can see the list. Um, perhaps one of the more interesting ones is the MTE support, which includes um, being able to, to have MTE information stored in a core file and recover that for GDB to analyze um, after the event. Um, support for the um, brain float, um, 16, uh, DFP, a bunch of things to do with M profile. Um, that's MVE is the mobile vector version. It's sort of a lightweight neon. Um, we've got PAC BTI coming for M profile as well. The architecture is slightly different to the AOX32, uh, sorry, the AOX64 PAC BTI, in that um, there are no spare bits in a pointer register, uh, being a 32-bit architecture. And so the PAC code is stored in a separate register when you execute it. And that has two consequences. One is that you have to make sure you save and restore that information if you're in a leaf function. Oh, sorry, not in a leaf function. Um, and the other is actually the, the, there are 32 pack bits now rather than just a few stored in the top of the pointer, um, which means that, in fact, it's, it's probably a more secure solution there than it can be on AF64. Um, we have other bits that are in flight, um, SVE enhancements, um, SME enablement, and... Uh, I think somebody is working on getting GDB to talk better with QEMU so that we can get get debug sessions looking more more like a real model. Or should I say more like a real piece of hardware? I think that's the last slide. Um, the only other thing that I've got is what do we do with MTE and glibc? Now, that's an interesting one. It might be more relevant for the glibc buff, but it's a bit ARM-centric at the minute. Um, was it you who was asking that, Javox? Um, I mean, some of these things are forward-looking features for which we, at least I don't have often direct visibility into users using the hardware with these features turned on. Mm -hmm. So the question really becomes like, if you see people using it, I mean, it's okay. What do we want to do with it? We, is there something wrong with the current implementation? Do we want to improve it? How do we improve it? So I think there's those open questions. But yeah. right now, the... I haven't seen any negative impact for the code that we have in there. It hasn't made it any harder to maintain those files. It's still pretty easy to go review that code. Um, I think maybe as I look at like doing some stuff with restartable sequences, I have to start thinking about, well, how does MTE play into there? What do I have to do? Does it have any impact? Like as, I re as code gets refactored or touched, then the questions become if MTE gets in the way of any of those modifications, is it problematic then? Yep. Uh, but it, it, it's up to you. I mean, you as contributors upstream to the ARM hardware support. We're kind of looking at you guys to say, 
yeah, this was good or this was a good experiment because we've got it behind a tunable, right? So you can turn, we can turn it on and customers can play with it and users can play with it and people using the hardware can play with it. I think one of the issues is at present it's configured by default to off and it, therefore standard glibcs will come without it. Uh, default to off entirely or default to on with the tunable off? I think it's default to not built in. Oh. It, certainly when I added the original code, it was experimental, and the default was not to enable the, the code at all. Yeah, so that was one question, that uh, we had a configuration option that we don't even enable uh, memory tagging because it affects malloc layout, essentially, to, to enable the tagging support. And... Uh, and then there is a runtime additional bit. But I think well, we asked distros to build glibc with this enabled, so we can at least notice if our malloc changes break something. But those are only supposed to change kind of uh, a few minor things in the malloc layout. And then there's a separate runtime enabled to enable actual tagging. Yeah, there's, there's essentially there's three levels at which it has to be enabled before it kicks in. Um, the first is your glibc has to be built with it, um, built in an MTE-capable way. The second one is that the hardware has to be detected at runtime as MTE-capable. And the third one is you then have to turn on the tunable in order to get to it. So there's quite a, quite a, quite a dance if you, if you want to enable it at present. Um, I think we're only talking about that first step. I think enable memory tagging. Um, it's, it was envisioned as a generic thing that other architecture might also want to support. So. Well, this is a boff, right? Yeah. One of the ways to get the data is to advertise that it's there. Yeah. I mean, we can't, we can't tell you whether your application is going to work with MTE. We've, we know that there are some applications that um, do violate MTE requirements. Um, Python was the first example that we ran into almost as soon as we turned it on, in that its allocator has an assumption that it can wander about within a page um, and particularly when you free something in Python, it tries to find the page that it's in to find out whether it's in its in malloc space or its own cache. Absolutely. So I will say that there are other CPU architectures that have complex features as well. Mm. And the way that we normally progress through this is you put something in the core runtimes, you turn it on with a tunable or something. And then you need to begin building everything in the distro because the distro is a great example for what customers it's and not, users are going to be doing. It's not so much building everything and in the distro because it's all contained within glibc. This is about testing everything but, in the distro. Um, yeah. Let me take a step back. I'll, mm. I'll give you a for example. If I had a hardware and I wired that hardware up to our Fedora copper build infrastructure, and it had MTE, and we turned it on, I could then use my, what we have as mass pre-build tooling to basically begin running the, a build of like the entire distro. Yeah. And the, the RPM side build for Python, for example, we'll build Python, and then a check will run the entire test suite, and we will see if that test suite passes or fails. Um, because at some point then later, you're going to keep building Python things, and it'll, it'll just all start aborting, right? Because if the interpreter is failing, then everything with the newly built Python is going to fail, and stuff is just all going to fall over, so you'll see it right away. Um, and to know if we, you can have that thing on, it is this brute force process of you begin doing all of this, then you find all the places where it's broken, and then you start fixing them. That's a lot of effort, mm -hmm. right? So you ha do have to ask yourself, like, is this a path you want to go down because the effort is worth the value or not and that's that's a hard like that's just a high level strategic question to ask yourself so like um i'll give you an example we put um 
CET in, which is very sim you know, similar, similar features as PAC BTI. When mm -hmm. you turn PAC BTI on, I guarantee you, you begin to see issues in the distro, and then you just have to work through those issues slowly through the, through the process. But it's definitely yeah. like a, um, your first level of interaction is with the distros. Because the distros have their builders, they have a build process, they, they have thousands of applications that yep. are going to become part of uh, uh, an environment that users are going to use. So like, if you have questions about MTE or questions about any other features you're enabling, I think interaction with the distros is one of the best ways to do this, experimentation mm -hmm. with the distros and working with the distro teams. Does that, I mean... Maybe I should have asked, are you looking for advice or not? Or <laughs> this is a boff, so. It's a boff. <laughs> it's a, yeah, we, we've provided the, the feature. For it to give value, it has to be enabled or enableable at runtime. Yeah. Um, and then to some extent, right, the standard uh, maxim applies. You can lead, lead a horse to, to water, but you can't make it drink. So in many ways right now, I'm like, the way we test experimental features, for example, is to, the strategy for testing experimental features is mass pre-building stuff in the distribution. Mm. Um, Copper is, uh, from the Fedora side, it's very similar to Ubuntu's universe in that you've got generic build infrastructure that you can then go feed things into the generic build infrastructure and, and use it. I don't, SUSE probably has a very similar kind of, you can feed anything to it. Build. Is there any SUSE people here? Um, but anyway, so, yeah, but the thing is, you also have to have the hardware wired up to that infrastructure so that you can then do the mass builds on the Absolutely. hardware. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we are currently using for hardware for Copper for Air 64. I have to go look at one of the build logs. But um, do we... Does that make sense? Does that, would that begin to answer some of the questions that you might have over whether the hardware feature is viable and it works or? Is it realistic to build a Fedora-like distribution on QMU? Yes, absolutely. So if you could, you just take QMU, if you have QMU that has the specific features all turned on, you can install Fedora, and then you could build a scripted process by which you, you know, you rebuild one package and then you start a, just a scripted, what's called a, a mock build, and mock's entire process is to build a system root out of the packages that come from the normal repo, and then build the one thing that you want inside of it. Um, because you're, gonna, you're saying, because you need to do the build locally because it's your QMU that has all the special magic hardware features turned on. Yeah, you, you, can, you can do a mock build, and then basically you just keep feeding, putting more things into the sysroot that mock is building into, and you keep feeding it the modified packages and putting them back in. It's not the greatest way from a reproducible build perspective, because... Um, the, some of the mass pre-build tooling we have is designed around copper and around copper's capacity to burst against multiple servers and things like that. But yeah, it'll just take you a long while to sit there and serialize your build, build a thing, put it back into the sysroot, build the next thing, and, and then keep going. You can do it. Yeah, absolutely. Fedora gives you all the tools. And if you want to try it, let's sit down together and we can, I can show you how to do an entire scripted build process for all the tools and you can see, start seeing what stuff falls over. So I think that the, your friends now are the downstream distros because we have, all, like we have all the process in place for retesting and rebuilding and making sure that a thing works um, in a scriptable way. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, when you, if, as you go up a level, you know, you're like, oh, I want, I'm enabling hardware. But down a level, the distros have all this automation and, and tooling and stuff that you might not be familiar with, which is why I'm always, you know, we should distros and hardware manufacturers, we need to be friends and we need to work through those processes together. And so to answer your question then, is what you would want to do is build a glibc with MTE turned on by default, have a QME running with MTE, heart, MTE enabled, and then begin building things in it and have QMU simulating all the MTE stuff correctly? 
Yes? Yeah. Okay, I see you nodding your head yes for those that can't see you because you're not in the camera and can't hear you because <laughs> you're, you're over there. Okay. Yeah. For that, the benefit of the camera, works. the answer is nodding his head. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that works. Do you want to do that? It's like, do you want to do that? Because again, it's like it's work. Like, yeah. So you begin the first, it's like, you know, 30,000 packages. So you start at the beginning and you've got one built and the 30,000 package line is way at the very end. Now you don't have to build all of them. You can start with what's called uh, a critical path base packages. So there's an initial group of packages in Fedora that are considered critical path. And then we can build all those with MT and see if the critical path base packages fail, then you're hosed, your system's not, you're not gonna be able to even begin bootstrapping the system. Yeah. So if the critical path base package is build, then we're on to the next conversation. And normally when I, like when I do a glibc update, lately I've been doing a mass rebuild of critical path base packages to make sure they boot. They make sure they build and they work. And I know Sousa has also a, a base bootstrap set that they bootstrap in Tumbleweed that is a, like this critical set of packages that you can make sure you can build over again. But we're going to hit Python right away because Ulipsy needs it. So you, you, need Python, you need a Python minimal. So is the Python issue fixed? I d well, I, I certainly haven't been to fix it. I'm not aware that anybody ha has at this okay. stage. Because so then you're saying that the second we turn on MTE, as soon as we're going to build Glibc, it's just going to fail if, because... If you set the environment variable by default, yes, it will... <laughs> so then it will this, be problematic, this whole exercise but... of having this conversation will just stop dead when we get to Python, and then the question will be, who's going to fix Python? Unless we start having ways of building certain packages with annotations which says, ignore the tunable and don't, don't enable it for this package. And then we get r essentially runtime build checks. Uh, sorry, runtime yeah. checks that. Okay, so you build. Let's say you build Python with tagging turned off. Well, uh, with with a flag that says don't turn it on at runtime. Yeah, but because it's it's a MT sure. is only done in glibc, and yeah. until, yeah, unless or until Python is put, is updated so. It's essentially it's, it's memory management. So you're code. saying that you'd have Python actually? You, we, we'd have to write a patch for Python to turn off MT at runtime. We'd have to write a patch, or, or something that the dynamic loader would re, would read as a tag in the binary that says ignore oh. uh, as a, some sort of attribute. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to use the term build attribute because that is no, something no, no. Build we use in ARM for, for static link time. For something. So yeah. there are uh, you know. GNU notes that we use for other things and yes. other architectures that the dynamic loader can load and it knows about them and you could say one of those notes could be don't run MTE because this piece of application is not MTE yeah. safe. Yeah. I mean it's, a, it's the same as the CET notes in, or PACBTI notes as well. The, some of those notes are composable um, in a certain way. And Florian writes, we'll probably need some form ELF markup to identify shared objects which are compatible with MTE. I bits must always be zero bits can be any value, but are not necessarily preserved, the, the, et the tricky bit is the decision of whether it's an opt-in or opt-out, because generally speaking, you would probably want MTE to be on, except when you know that the problem has been um, analyzed and shown to be um, a real, pro um, not a, a, a bug in the program. Yeah. Because if MTE defaults to off, actually, most programs don't get checked, mm -hmm. which defeats the point of it. Sure, but so, I mean, in glibc, you generally control, like, we're going to start using MT for these things, and, well, is it, are we back to, um, is MTE per process? Yes. Okay, good, right? So then I can start up a container or something that uses MTE, and so it's top-level process, and that container has MTE turned on, and all the children that that process has will have MTE turned on, unless the dynamic loader sees a, uh, you know, a note that is, an, is a, you know, a runtime note that the loader loads and then sees, and then, then we turn MTE off? Uh, yeah, I mean, MTE has to be enabled by the kernel per yep. process. Yep. Um, it has to be, um, for MTE to work, that the memory has to be MTE taggable. Um, but there's a general assumption in the kernel that um, either all memory is taggable or no memory is taggable. There are parts of the application which can't be tagged because the kernel doesn't support tagging 
um, the BSS, um, the, the initial um, uh, break extendable t uh, memory. So in MTE, when we turn that on in, in, for malloc, we switch to the MMAP versions for all for all allocations. Um, is there another limitation? Yeah, we don't currently support MTE on the stack, but that could come as a later date, I think. But it, as soon as you get MTE on the stack, you run into the position where you can't have a binary that's portable to older machines. The glibc code can runtime detect because it can put everything through that's relevant through function points as or dynamic checks. Running MTE checks on every single function on entry and exit in order to determine whether to clean up the stack or not would probably make it so expensive as to not be viable as a standard deployment. You'd probably turn it on as a debugging aid, much like you would do uh, some of the other checkers that we have. We've probably exhausted that one. At least for now. It sounds like as soon as you build GLC, though, in this whole process that we've talked about building with the thing, you just need to find something first. And therefore, you need the LS markup. And we have already a whole process in, in LDSO to do that markup processing and analysis. Mm. There is a section, and we have access to it, and we, it's allocatable, and we reload it, and you can access it. You make this ad based on which <laughs> 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 yes, because I'm not entirely happy with the way GNU properties turned out. Its uh, user interface is not uh, very ergonomic. Uh, uh, the linker magically combines these, but you don't really have a fine-grained control over how you, uh, if you want to override that. And same in the assembly level, when you have assembly files, if you want to mark some assembly, uh, some object code that generated from assembly uh, uh, with some property, you don't have good uh, user interface there. You have to write some directives into the assembly file and these sort of problems. Um, I, so, so if you expect a lot of widely, widely used packages to require some magic marker and we have to go there and convince them to put all of these my, in their my inclination, system, might be yeah. a bit, uh, My inclination for that would be the default is to assume that things are MTE clean unless you tell them otherwise. Right. Um, and that way you don't have to go around and rebuild every single object file before you can enable MTE. But to, to do that, though, that much, you basically need a compiler flag and the compiler flag has to say, I'm not MTE clean, compile everything. Or, or even a build attribute, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, a function attribute inside the source code that says sure. not tagging compatible. Sure, and then yeah. the compiler would have to turn that into the more complex uh, node attribute, the mm. attribute gets propagated by the static linker, the static linker makes sure it's in the right place for the LDS to load it. There's just, there's a finite number of ways we can skin that cat in terms of, you've got to get data, so to propagate it through build systems, you have to I would say, like, what we've learned is to propagate it through build systems, you gotta be able to put it in a flag somewhere. Then, or if you have a function attribute, sure, that needs to go down, and then when you, you need to define the semantics of what happens. It has to somehow end up as metadata that a loader can load. And so we, we have examples of how to do that now. We can do it differently if you want, but we, there has to be value in that difference, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you, if you don't like the way it's done today, yeah, it's a bit crufty, but it is metadata in the binary that we can load with the loader, analyze it, and then take an action in the dynamic loader based on that, that data. Um, and the static linker makes a decision about what it does with that information on a, as it assembles the object files and puts it all together. I think Binutils has custom code for all that stuff because the, the semantics are slightly different in each one. So, 
Alex has a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, this might be a bit naive, but I'm just wondering, like, um, why haven't we tried to fix Python? Is there? Um, I, it seems like uh, well, it would be an per interesting. Personally place. speaking, I've just not had time to go and look at it. Uh, I don't know whether we have contribution sure. things sorted out for Perhaps. doing work on Python. Perhaps um, other teams in ARM, though, might be interested. Perhaps in other way. teams in ARM could, but I, I'm not aware that anybody has kind of looked at it. Right. I, I think it's fairly fundamental to its, its getting good performance out of the memory system with yeah, Python I, objects. It's not about fixing it. They have a solution that they like. I think it might be even possible to turn off at configuration time, but that's not how distros build Python, because I think Valgrind needs it as well to properly work because Python does magic with malloc and and if you want to catch memory bugs you have to, that it has an option to be more more proper use of malloc but then it's slower basically the problem is in order to avoid calling malloc all the time it has its own mini allocator and when you free a Python object, it first looks to see whether it, that object lies in one of its own mini allocator pages. And if it is, it releases it that way. And if it's not, it calls free to free the object through the normal system. But as soon as you've got MTE, as soon as you try to free an object that is um, actually allocated through malloc, you can't go and read the page header for the object that that's in. Uh, because it's not valid to, to look at random places elsewhere in the page. So you, you either need to put in some special annotations to say, um, do this in, the, in a way that doesn't do the tag checking, or you need to do other, other ways of restructuring the code. It would be fixable. Um, there's no reason why it can't be done. Um, I think it's valuable also, though, to just be capable of putting this markup in place right away because mm. you don't know what else is busted. And so you spend all this time trying to fix Python, and then a million other things are busted. And so really, like, being able to walk the distro gives you a good evaluation of mm. where else are there problems. So you do this first pass, and you look at, okay, all these things built, all these things are broken, and then now you go back and you look at them. And Python's one you've already evaluated, but there's going to be a lot more that you probably want to look at so in many ways, the markup helps you do that. And the markup's also a way out for customers well, the, the, or the, users they haven't written The, the markup really is a stopgap because you, if you've, the, the thing is if you, if you disable MTE because the allocator can't, can't handle it, any other violations elsewhere in the program won't be found either. So ideally, you would fix the allocator to work properly in an MTE environment. Yeah, but um, I, ideally as a function of user, user resources, absolutely, yes. exact machines yeah. that they're using. And so I, I wouldn't go as far to call it a stopgap. I would go as far as saying that some of these hardware features just need ways to have them not on, and that needs to be often a compositional issue of like components in the system. So you assemble a bunch of components to do a thing for your workload, and it turns out one of those components just doesn't support the feature that you want. So there needs to be a way to possibly turn on that feature because the composition now can't support that feature. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, speaking personally again, yeah. um, I would see you know, long term, if MTE does survive and, mm -hmm. and take off, it would almost get bound to um, SE Linux type security levels. And you might say, I insist that all programs yes. run with MTE enabled yeah. um, because I don't, I, my security level says that that's the level of security I need out of things running on the system. Maybe that's not exactly the right, the right way, but something of that nature could be mm -hmm. a policy level of, of the machine depending on your trust levels. Sure, yeah. But I mean, in, in that case, uh, SE Linux ha is gonna have to enforce that whenever glibc tries to turn MTE off, how do we turn MTE off right now? Is there a, like I said? Uh, I shouldn't think, yeah, we've done the work to enable that sort of thing yet. It's, yeah. uh, 
No, but it's, I'm saying it's so, but so then from a policy perspective, yeah. the SE Linux on the kernel side is going to prevent that syscall from succeeding, and you're going to get an error back from that syscall, and then LDSO just terminates the process and says, mm -hmm. you know, well, I tried to turn it off, but I couldn't, so sorry. I can't, because there needs to be an answer to, although the markup was there to turn it off, if the policy said that it wasn't, then I, and I try to turn it off, and so, and SE Linux needs to work, I mean, the process needs to work no matter what, and it needs to be terminated yeah. if it doesn't meet those requirements. I don't know. I mean, maybe SE Linux, as, as currently structured, is not the right answer, because at, at present, you probably can't enforce that binaries do enable the markup. You could always drink a link in a different malloc that didn't have memory tagging to get around the, the fact that the, the glibc one has that. Um, in fact, the general problem, and, and, and I suspect this will be the case, is that the applications that fail under MTE for while still being valid programs, as opposed to genuine bugs, will be those that are trying to do their own manage memory management, exactly like Python does. So Emacs is probably going to be another one that doesn't yeah, work and when you... Ruby will as well, because yeah. it has a... Well, I guess not. I mean, if you don't use glibc's malloc... If it doesn't use malloc, then it probably wouldn't hit the problem. If it's using mmap for all its, yeah, it's Ruby blocks. uses mmap for everything yeah. now with the latest Ruby. And that had to do with the fact that it used to use glibc malloc, but they want exact 4K pages with no metadata used in those 4K pages. So yeah. for their and, and for them, if they want MTE support, they would have to embed it to in their it. own yeah. memory allocator system. Yeah. OK. So it, going back we, to Zabos, is this, this just a question of just <coughs> doing some QMU tests and some build tests? Or is this not really? Because that's that's all, just always going to fail. So I guess the real question is defining for ARC64 what you want to express in the dynamic loader and its semantics for hardware features that have this kind of compositional issue, right? You have to express those. Well, at one level, I don't think it's what I want or what ARM wants. It's what the community wants out of this. You know, we provide the hardware, yeah. you decide how you use those features to get the best security or debuggability or whatever out of the system. Yeah, Sadesh yells system-wide tunables with markup as an exception to allow specific applications to work without MTE. Sure, yeah. I think we want the markup. I think when the dynamic loader has to make a really early decision about this. But it's it, up can, to it can technically turn it off after it's been turned on, it can, I think, turn it off after it's been on. Um, Sorry, but actually, it can't turn it back on again, have, having turned it off. Yeah, so what actually happens, we, we don't, it, by, you start by turning it turned off, and you have to explicitly turn it on. So you have to opt in, essentially. Mm. Uh, anyway, what I just wanted to say is, yes, it's... Uh, it's a poss possibility that oh, we just have to have markings. My other problem with markings is that the semantics is not at all trivial because we can have markings like empty, and it's not just empty because we have a long list of architecture features that can use some kind of markings. But you can have things like, oh, this binary uses the top bits of pointers, or this binary uh, assumes 4K uh, or page page granularity, granularity protection, and those those uh, will fail with MT in different ways. So you can have like multiple different markings. You can have one specific MT marking, or you can have like a higher level marking that uh, can be used by things like HWSN and other similar things. Uh, so one of the reasons. We didn't try to do anything with markings because it's not an obvious design on how, how to do that. Yeah. We're pretty much out of time. Any questions on ARM as opposed to ARH 64? Nope, in which case I think we're done. Oh, Carol. You were nearly out of time. Well, what do you think we should deprecate next? Sorry? What do you think we should deprecate next? Um, uh, V4, 
four, so that's strong arm. <laughs> Is it time for that to go? Um, I can't. IWMXT. Sorry? IWMXT. IWMX. Pretty, uh, Is strict. anybody still using Xscale? Uh, Nick's not in the room, so he was the, uh, the maintainer for that. So I can't ask him whether anybody, he's, he's still interested in maintaining that. 4T, not a chance. Not a chance. No, not, not yet. Arm still sips a lot of 70 DMI products. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say arm ships. Arms partners ship a lot of 70 DMI based products even today. I don't know how widely they are used in new designs and therefore how relevant it is for GCC to carry on supporting it. But until I'm told very distinctly otherwise, 40 is not on the option list for removal. And to be honest, even if we did, it would probably only take us to 5T and the differences are not that huge. There are one or two useful things that we could assume like interworking, but um, that's about the only one that's Broken is probably not the word, not implemented is what the word I would use. But <laughs> right, well, thank you, everyone. We've filled the hour somehow. <laughs> <laughs>